meeting of let me start again good evening this is a meeting of the amherst town council finance committee meeting um, counselors have been other counselors have been invited to attend as a committee of the whole it is a special meeting of the finance committee meeting and andy steinberg who is chair of the finance committee will be chairing that so Based on Governor's Baker, Baker's orders, uh, we are allowed to hold this meeting virtually. I am going to call on each of the counselors and ask if they can hear us and we can hear them. And then Andy is going to call on the other people who are on the finance committee that are not and do the same thing. So I will begin with Alyssa Brewer. Present. Thank you. Um, Pat DeAngelis. Present. Darcy Dumont. Here. Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. George Ryan. Present. Evan Ross. Present. Steve Schreiber. I'm here. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Dorothy Pam. Here. Shalini Balmill. Present. Did I miss any counselors? Me, Sarah Schwartz, present. I'm, I'm sorry, Sarah Schwartz, present. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to recognize that uh, there's a quorum of the Finance Committee just uh, who've already uh, registered their presence uh, previously um, and we want to call the finance committee to order but there are some members of the finance committee who are not counselors and so I need to confirm that they can hear and be heard. Bernie Kubiak. Unmute. You're on mute. It's on mute to Bernie. Present. Uh, Bob Hegner. Present. And is Jane Scheffler here? I'm here. Okay, so um, I think we have all three, all members of uh, the Finance Committee who have now checked in and confirmed that they can uh, participate in the meeting. Uh, this is, as uh, Lynn noted this is a meeting of the Finance Committee. It's a meeting to review the social services section of the uh, budget. It is found on pages 186 through 189 of the proposed budget and it is a part of the community services function. Section 5.5a of the charter requires the Finance Committee to, and I quote, thoroughly review the budget and make a presentation and recommendation to the full town council within 30 days of referral, unquote. Because it was possible, um, as noted, uh, we now have a quorum of both committees, the, uh, the council and the full and the committee. The budget submitted to the council on May 3rd proposes the appropriation of $130,000 for fiscal year 22 as personnel services for two community responder positions. I will begin the meeting by asking the town manager to explain that recommendation. I will then ask members of the finance committee and counselors who are not members of the finance committee if they have any questions. Members of the community services working group are joining in to the meeting. I don't know, are they um, on this call now? Tina? They're in the uh, audience. Okay, uh, we, when, when I will have to ask that if they need the opportunity to call the meeting to order once they join this meeting, because it would be in the, then a public meeting. Um, and uh, I will also, there will be an opportunity for um, the uh, for a limited public comment during the meeting, when the community services working group here is here, 
Um, I understand that they may have something additional to present, but I uh, have asked that they uh, not repeat the Monday presentation since all of the present have had the opportunity to see the Monday presentation. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Paul. Um, and uh, since uh, he's made the budget proposal, um, we want to start by hearing from him. And as I say, then opening it up to counselors and members of the Finance Committee to ask questions uh, is the next step. Paul, Great. please proceed. Thank you, Andy. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present this portion of the budget. I'm glad that you've carved out a separate day to, to do it because it's an important and significant proposal. And I especially recognize that the Finance Committee has already had one three hour meeting today and we'll try to be efficient in the presentation so we can get to questions and answers and uh, comments uh, after that. I wanna note that I'm joined here uh, by several members of our staff because this, there, there are a lot of people who are involved in helping to uh, form this. First is our police chief, Scott Livingstone, uh, Captain Ron Young, and Captain Gabe, Gabe Ting. Our dispatch center chief um, is Mike Curtin is here. Fire chief, Tim Nelson. Our director of senior services, Mary Beth Ogilovitz. And then our finance team, Sonia Aldridge and Sean Mangano are all in the room. I think that's, who, I think that's everybody that's here that I recognize. Okay. so. Uh, if you want to start the um, slide deck, Athena. So we are in a unique moment in history. We have the opportunity to listen to our community and actually for the community to speak and align the services we provide, specifically public safety services and policing. I've been welcomed to sit with the community safety working group for the intense work that they have done. What has come out of their work has created a new dialogue within the community. The work they have done shaped this revised proposal and on a personal note, changed how I think about my role and public policy in general. Next slide. Based on the report of the working group, I believe that we are united on the goal of, of reimagining public safety so that every incident receives the right response at the right time. Currently, we have one tool for any issue that comes up, whether it's a kitten stuck in a tree or a person sleeping in a, in a bank vestibule or a person with a gun in the woods. That tool is a police officer with a cruiser. These police officers are well-trained with a broad range of skill sets, but it isn't always the best way to respond to a call. And I think both the members of the public have said that, the members of the police department have said that, many people say that it's, it's a limited tool set. The proposal in concert with the recommendations of the working group and in line with dozens of other communities who are exploring the same area is to create a new department to be located in the community services section of the budget to offer unarmed community responders to, to designated calls. If we get this right, this in turn will change the role and mission of our police officers. It's important to note that this is not the first time we've looked at this type of redefinition of policing. Since the 80s, the town has moved dispatch from uniformed officers to civilians, established an, a, 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 an animal welfare officer, has established civilian parking enforcement officers. And most recently, if you recall a year ago, uh, we established the, the COVID ambassadors because we felt that it was important for non-uniformed officers to be responding to complaints about COVID and things like that. So there's always been a willingness and an eagerness to try to align our services with the need of the time. So next slide. So why is now the right time? So it's, it's a rare occurrence for the town to establish an entirely new department. With this proposal, budget proposal, I'll be bringing a detailed proposal to the council to take this important step. This is the opportune time to take the significant uh, step in our, in our government. Last year, the town council adopted goals Important groundwork and vision has been laid out by the working group and community support has been offered. Town staff, most importantly, the police chief and his leadership team supports delivering services on key um, calls in a different way. The working group's report de details many of the values that should be incorporated in this program. 
I don't, I won't document them here, but I highly recommend that the working groups that you read, the working group software report, if you haven't already, it, it really is a good piece of work. Um, and also there are dozens of other communities who are engaging in the same kind of work that we are now. So there's, there's an opportunity for us to learn, to, to look at best practices and to share our experiences with other communities as well. Um, and then there are some other opportunities such as, you know, funding. We've, we believe there'll be grant, we know there'll be grant opportunities coming our way. Um, and then we know that this conversation is happening, not just in the town of Amherst, but also on campuses of Hampshire, Amherst Col Hampshire and Amherst College and the University of Massachusetts. Next slide. So what I'm gonna to do tonight, and this is sort of the, the, the direction of the slide, is I wanna talk about the Community Responder Program and talk about the elements of that and give you a timeline, update on the proposal, things like that. Talk about future fiscal years as well. Um, I wanna talk additionally about the other proposals, some of the other proposals that the Community Safety Working Group had identified in their report. And then we'll open that up for questions. Next slide. So there are many considerations to, um, take, to take into consideration. And we want to make sure that our plan that we develop is aligned with the resources that we have. We want it to be based on data analysis. We want to make sure that we will have adequate staffing when we put forth a community responder program. And we want to have the appropriate staffing at the police department. And, and we wanna make sure that before we launch a program, we have all the things set up so that it will be a success. The, the goal for all of us is that this be a successful program and that be sustainable over time. And that includes training, policies and procedures in a long-term implementation plan. The proof of concept is what is proposed. We really wanna show that it will really work. Is the, is the new program effective at a moment of crisis? Are communication lines strong and redundant? Do all parties understand their roles and the others who may be responding? So our mission is to match our resources to our needs. And right now, I think there's a the feeling that this is not the case. Craft, we wanna craft a program that needs, meets the needs of the calls being handled, which is again, the right response at the right time. Next slide. So um, what I have included in this is the funding for in the community services budget. So we, we purposely, and uh, in listening to the working group, have, have taken this in a different section of the budget uh, to have it a, so we can have an acknowledgement of where it, that it really is about a different way of responding to calls. The intention is to plan and pilot the program for implementation in FY22. And then in the process, establish baseline metrics that we can then uh, measure and follow up on and see how the program is doing. Is it handling the right calls? Are we, are we transferring the calls, the right calls to the program and are they able to handle them? Does it need to be uh, adjusted? We wanna make sure that this program is recalibrated based on any kind of feedback we get from people who are making calls and, or people, and how we respond to them. Also, we wanna talk about the calls that aren't going into 911. We wanna see if there's additional calls that might come directly to community responders and what that would look like, because there is a sense that there are people who won't call 911 that maybe will call a community responder program for support. Next slide. So, um, so I'm not gonna go into the details, but, and so this, this packet is in, in this um, slide deck is in your, in your packets. Um, but I wanted to lay out a, basically a, with an 11 month plan for how we get from here to there with, with some um, items that would have to, that would happen month by month. So we would start in July, well, actually we'd probably start in June because I'll, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and we would, I would, we would pull together our management team. We'd pull together, we would request um, participation from members of the work, community safety working group if they are willing to do that. Uh, we would want to engage with other stakeholder groups who may benefit, will benefit from this program, such as those uh, people experiencing homelessness, substance abuse, mental health challenges, things like that. Um, We'll want to look at the data that, that we need to collect through the LEAP program, which I'll talk about in a second. 
and other social service providers who are al already doing some of this work in a different way that the uh, police department and fire department utilize currently. We want to talk to the fire department. Um, I mean, Tim will be part of the program, but to understand they're on the front lines for many of these calls as well. And then we want to finalize that first month, the, the timeline. I went th that group to really lock down the timeline so we have benchmarks and milestones that we'll hit. Um, so in August, we'll talk about the kinds of calls that we'll need to go to the community responders program. We will utilize the support of the LEAP program who has done this for many communities. Um, and they have a they have an experience and sort of can make an informed judgment about what kinds of calls are good to be um, reprogrammed. Um, we wanna develop more of the program details. Um, are we doing employees contracts for services? What's the role of the fire department? The, role, the fire department has paramedics on duty 24 seven. Are there, are there ways that we can um, access additional firefighters to provide support for the program? Um, you know, I think these things should all be on the table. And then in August also before, uh, I wanna make sure that we can have a meeting with the full community safety working group to re review the progress to date and gather additional input. This is the group of people who've put as much time as anybody on this program to date. Um, in September, we'd looking, be looking for job descriptions for the lead community responder. This would be a leadership position um, who will be the, the, the primary person charged with implementing the program. And we'd be doing job descriptions for all the community responders. We'd wanna be developing our policies and procedures. And in September is when I would make the initial departmental proposal to the town council with all the backup that you would expect. And I'd be looking to you for the kinds of information you will want for that to make a successful um, presentation. Just as a, as a footnote, under the town charter to create a new department, the town council has to approve it. Next slide. So in October, we'd look at, we'd review the department. I assume that there'll be a process with the town council to review the departmental proposal. Typically the town council refers it to one or more committees. So we would be reviewing that with the different committees that the council chooses to have it discussed. Um, we'd be finalizing our policies and procedures. Um, we would see, hope, we'd hope that the council would approve the new department in October. Uh, we'd be setting up the training programs that these responders would need and we would have recruited our lead uh, community responder. And then in November, we have the person working, they re we start recruiting with that person taking the lead, we start recruiting our community responders. Uh, December, we finalize our training program, we get the, all the material in place, such as a vehicle or vehicles. Um, we have to have the community responder space where they're gonna be located, identified and outfitted and all the little logistics. And yet they, they, they seem small, but they take, each one might take time. Uh, in January, we, we declare this program, the pilot program operational and we'd start training. I think, you know, many of these programs require up to 50 hours or more of training um, for community responders. And so we wanna have adequate and ample time for the responders because they will be Taking on some difficult things, we make sure they have all the de-escalation techniques and uh, all, everything that they need to make be a successful responder. Next slide. So by February, we wanna have everybody hired. We think we wanna have the training being completed. We wanna have the finalized all the protocols for call handling by the dispatchers. We want in March and we wanna keep the training going and, and the we want to, we will have to do training of all of our dispatchers. We have a number of dispatchers who work uh, around the clock. So they all have to be trained and understand the processes. We will need to talk about alternative phone numbers, um, how we handle those. If there's a dedicated line um, for handling calls, uh, there's some interest with a, the working group to have a, a line that would go straight to the responders. I think with our new phone system that is, uh, has many more enhancements that is more achievable with our current phone system. Um, we have to understand, are these calls gonna be recorded or not? How are, they, how are we gonna monitor things? If, if they need to be monitored, what are the legal ramifications of, of these types of things? Um, and you know, I, I think that de depending on how we work through the dispatch and the phone call thing, we set up a, um, just as a side note, uh, during COVID, we set up a separate call-in line, the COVID hotline, that was um, staffed many hours all day, all day during the week and then on weekends as well. 
uh, by ambassadors so that there was a, a live person answering the call during the peak times when calls were coming in. And we found that to be a high value thing because it, it was important for people to, when, they call, when they're calling in a crisis, that they get a voice. They don't get a machine. Someone says, I'll call you back. So staffing that up appropriately will be an um, important task to figure out how to make that happen. Uh, in April, we'll be looking to um, pre present a report to the council on how the program is working. Because in May, I'll be presenting a new budget for FY23, and I think they'll probably be talking about FY24 as well uh, in, in order to keep the program up and running. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna ask Sean to go through the budgetary pieces of this, if you don't mind, Sean. Yeah, um, so the first piece here is the implementation team. This is um, the different uh, department heads that would be involved in, in sort of that first phase um, of the tasks that were described. Um, we didn't quantify what this would be, but obviously there's a, there's a value to this. Um, the second piece are the community responders themselves. And so there's sort of a lead community responder, which is the, what we've labeled here as a director. And then there, we are proposing four actual community responders for the first year. Um, and so the value of that, again, these are all estimates until we actually hire people and make decisions about where they would fall on a, on a salary grid and what, what salary grids they would fall on. Um, but our estimate for that piece of it is 150,000 for FY22. Um, and our proposed way we would fund this is the 130 that was reallocated um, from the police department to the social services department. And then we also, uh, identified in a, at a prior finance committee meeting that there was also about $40,000 in educational incentives um, that we felt we could repurpose as well. Uh, the next piece is an administrative support position. Um, again, so you can see there's different time frames for based on the calendar that we just discussed. And so this would be a seven month position. We're estimating this would cost about 30,000. This would also co come from um, the, the staffing and the educational incentives budget. Um, between the 130 and the 40,000 we identified, it's about 170,000. Um, so we're a little bit short of that target, but um, again, there's gonna be a lot of wiggle, there's gonna be a lot of change when we actually fill these positions. Uh, we're estimating the benefits associated with those positions will be around $45,000. Um, we don't know who will, who won't elect health insurance. So this is just an estimate at this point. And then the last piece that we're proposing is to use um, about $250,000 from either the American Rescue Plan Act or other grants if we identify them. Um, the, under the American Rescue Plan Act, the criteria that this would fall under would be the revenue replacement criteria. And so we're proposing that to be used for the consulting that would go on, the training, um, the purchase of a vehicle, supplies, or year one supplies, because there'd be a, a greater amount of supplies needed to be purchased in the first year, um, and outfitting the space. And so the total of all of these, uh, these different pieces about 475,000. Thanks, next slide. Thanks, John. So there's two things that we're doing now uh, in May and June of this year. The first is uh, we have had many discussions as has the members of the Community Safety Working Group with a group called the Law Enforcement Action Partnership. And they have become sort of specialists in developing community responder programs and other alternative policing efforts. Um, I know the chief and his staff were on a call today with them talking about the calls that need to be analyzed and we, would, we will seek to contract with them uh, in, in this fiscal year to provide some of the data that we need, such as uh, truly analyzing the calls for service, understanding how we categorize calls and we will open the, that's why Mike Curtin is here from the dispatch so he can help if there are any questions along that. We want them to help us with asset mapping and how other towns have done record keeping, uh, things like that. Um, the other thing is that there is a, um, you know, I, I talked about how we have many communities all working in the same space at the same time. Not, a, not everyone, but many of them. And we're all at different phases. So uh, Harvard's Kennedy School of Government has reached out and they have a government performance lab. And we are applying this week to, to be a part of their Harvard, their community of practice, where they will group communities based on where they are in the process. So we are sort of in the middle of the process. We are, we're not just thinking about it, we're actually doing it, but we're not at the Eugene or Albuquerque or Denver model where they're looking at the next phase. 
Um, and so, in fact, the call I was on had people from Eugene and Albuquerque and Houston, Texas and places like that because they're looking for their own community of practice supported by the Kennedy School because we're all, we can learn from each other and we have to create a program that's unique to our town because we are a unique town. Um, we're a unique town partially because of the university, but there are other university towns, but we're relatively small compared to a lot of the other communities that are building this. So that has to be taken into consideration, but they have other small communities that they, I'm hoping that they'll group us with. So they are, this is a no cost thing. It's an application. You would have to get, get approved and they will provide 12 months of support, uh, technical assistance as we need it. Um, and it really is, you know, learning about that this was available sort of matched up so perfectly because we're in this spot and we want to be able to do this in a really smart way. Um, so in this in this program, if we get if we get admitted to it, we'll begin in August of 2021. Next slide. So uh, these are the types of things that um, we will, the community safety working group has a pretty deep, they've identified all these things. I mean, quite honestly, I've stole a lot of this out of the report because, you know, they've identified the issues that we need to be talking about. Um, you know, some of the other things that might be in here is um, what data is public? What are the legal requirements? You know, if, are they mandatory reporters? Um, if they come into a certain situation, there are a myriad of legal issues that we want to make sure that we don't put anybody that we hire into a bad situation legally or um, through safety, it's just physical safety either. Or, uh, and so, and we also, as I mentioned earlier, we wanna talk about what calls are not going to 911 um, and talk about the alternative um, phone systems that we might have to, we might look to implement as part of this program. So next slide. So, this is you know, where it becomes more difficult because I think year one, we never thought was going to be a challenge, but years two, three and beyond will be because we anticipate that the program will grow. Um, we anticipate that you know, right now we're funding it basically for half a year. We're gonna automatically have to fund it for a full year, even if it doesn't add any new people, there's an there's a impact on the budget, but we also anticipate that there will be a need for additional community responders and there's a cost to that. And this is probably the most important part of the work that we need to do. Um, so I think that the, we are um, looking at adding significant funds. And as everybody knows, under the, the limits of Proposition 2.5, we're limited to increasing our budget, our property tax by 2.5% plus any new growth that comes. So this will be a important factor to see how we can fund this program um, going forward. Next slide. So I want to list some of the challenges um, that are out there. So, and I think I've, you know, there is the the budget for FY22. There is a so, tremendous urgency for change that we need to address, and that's why we have a fairly aggressive timeline. If you looked at Northampton, they're taking a year to plan. Um, they're hiring a, you know, they're taking a different approach. So they're we're trying to do the planning in about six or seven months. Um, we need to have a detailed plan for implementing and piloting. I think the council will require a pretty comprehensive plan in order to approve a new department for the town. Uh, I've talked about the, the budget challenges. You know, we want to really craft a program that matches the needs of the town. Um, so, and we want to create, we want to recruit excellent community responders. I think some of the research that's been done by the working group was that it might not be the degree you have, it might be the attitude that you bring to the job. And we want to understand the labor market, um, talking to other um, social service agencies who might be hiring the same types of people. And so we can align our hiring requirements to match the needs of the program and the skills that are readily available with our candidates. And once we have this program up and running and it's successful, we want to ensure that the police department's mission and purpose are aligned with the staffing provided by the town. So if we have a new program in place, it means we need to be thinking about what is the police department's role as well going forward. And the fire departments, for that matter, might have impact on both of those things. Um, and then the, the key, though, again, just from looking, talking to people is that making sure to recognize that we always think that Amherst is unique. And in this situation, we truly are. And we need to put the time in to craft the program so it meets the needs of our community members. Our goal is to create 
a policing program and community safety response program that meets the needs of our community. Next slide. So I wanted to address some of the other um, items that were in the working group. So the, the, the working group took a broader look at the issues it was examining. Um, it, shot, it, it sought to um, ensure public safety response is anti-racist, um, equitable, just, and fair. But they did the next thing too. They wanted to offer preventive services that get at the root of assisting residents to avoid public safety involvement in the first place. And I commend them for that, taking that extra step. And I wanna address some of the things that they have talked about and because um, it aligned with some of the things we've been thinking, some of them have aligned with some of the things we've been thinking about. So the first is um, how is the town addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion work? What many people call DEI, and you'll see that in this presentation, diversity, equity, inclusion. My son is, um, works with difficult children and, and, and they, they call it JEDI, uh, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion because the kids get excited about being part of the JEDI team. Um, so the budget proposal calls for the creation of a DEI coordinator, which is already in the, in the budget as presented. And by reallocating an existing position and using our, some ARPA funds uh, to create a new position that will be a DEI coordinator. The, the, the budget that you have in front of you also includes a separate $80,000 request for anti-racism work that is included in the town manager's budget. This is that $80,000 that was in last year's budget that paid for the consulting group and some stipends for the working group and some other work by the, um, by the uh, core equity team for the town of Amherst. In addition, uh, I'm prepared to dedicate the funds allocated to the economic development director position currently that's in the town manager's budget and to reallocate those funds to a DEI director position. Um, this is a difficult decision on my part um, because both are high needs, um, but I feel like at this moment in time where we are, um, this is a higher priority for the community and am prepared to reallocate those funds to this position. Next slide. So the proposal also um, addressed the need for a youth empowerment center. And you know, th this definitely merits exploration. Um, I, we think um, it should be done in partnership with the schools. The schools already have a um, family center that does some of the same things, but probably not everything. So I think we can, there's some lessons to be learned from the work that they did uh, on their program, but also um, sort of gauge how this would look. Their, um, and so I would ask our new DEI director and our new recreation director to work on this, this uh, proposal for this for the next um, budget season. Next slide. And likewise with the uh, BIPOC Cultural Center, uh, which they, the working group I, I articulated as a, as a high value, um, we would be looking at this along the same lines as the, um, as the previous options. Next slide. And then the, the community safety working group is gonna be working on the next phase of their charge, which is the resident oversight board. And, um, and I'm eager to hear and work with them on what that type, what that um, oversight board should look like. So I don't wanna really uh, opine on much of this. Um, I, can, I believe I can speak for the chief and he'll scream if I don't, but we both support the creation of a oversight board of some sort that, um, that gives a, a place for people to go if they have complaints that aren't being handled uh, well by the police department. Um, and we wanna develop this, the charge for the oversight group and review that with the council as well. And you know, there is, if there are funds needed to support this, this work, we'd be looking at that $80,000 that's set aside in the town manager's budget for some of this work. Next slide. So that's our presentation, my presentation. And so I look forward to questions and concerns you may have. Thank you, Paul. Um, appreciate the presentation and I'm gonna be recognizing um, both counselors and um, resident members of the finance committee in the order in which hands get raised. So please use the hand raise function and we'll start with uh, Melissa Brewer. 
Um, thank you for that presentation, Paul. And I'm so excited that you were able to share those slides with us earlier today in between all the other meetings. And I'm also really excited to see the progress that we've made since the initial amount of money that was discussed for this and, and just the way you've taken everything to heart and tried to figure out creative ways to approach it. So this is incredibly interesting and I really look forward to our deliberation. I have a small thing that I feel like is actually a framing issue that actually matters. And I don't wanna detract from really meaty discussions, but I am really, my gut instinct when you first brought this up is I love the fact that it's under community services because people complain about, you know, how much money do we actually spend on serving people in different ways? And so obviously public safety is one of those ways, but the senior center, veterans, recreation, pools, et cetera. I really dislike, dislike is not a strong enough word, calling this social services. Social services feels like a throwback to 1950s welfare programs for needy people, as opposed to something that benefits our entire community. So I don't wanna ask you to pay somebody for branding. <laughs> and I know you had to call it something. And I appreciate totally that it's within the community services umbrella. That makes so much sense to me, but let's have everybody put their heads together and come up with another name for it. Because I really feel like it calls this out as a separate thing when it's not. It's something that's literally for everyone, far more so than the senior center is, for example, or veteran services is, which have much narrower populations. So I look forward to that just so that we can make it clear that this is a very holistic approach that you're promoting and that, that's intended here. And sometimes those words do matter. So thank you. If I can answer that, Andy. So I think that's a really good point. I think we did that because, and so you can weigh in here, we had a budget line item that was already established was that Sonia, do you want to, I mean, it was really, it was more, more like, do we create a new budget line item or do we just take one that's already in existence? And so, so I think you're right. We can rename, look at renaming that or. Yeah, we can, um, we can rebrand that um, going forward to something else than social services. The only, the only thing we'll have to keep in mind is if there's other things we do in the future, then we may have to create a separate grouping, which is something we can do. So, yeah. It's, it's just so, a chart of accounts thing. <laughs> So again, uh, we're opening. We're open for questions. Uh, Kathy, I too want to thank you, Paul. Um, you know, the distance between what we saw as one little piece of a budget to uh, this larger view, and I, I definitely think thinking about th this is a next year will be a transitional period for us. Um, I, uh, as some people know, I've have a background or for years worked on healthcare policy and we would come up with fabulous ideas and people would say, how do you plan on implementing them? And can you get them up and running next week? And it would turn out we actually couldn't get them up and running next week, you know, but we could get them up and running. It wasn't that they weren't doable. So I, I just have a couple questions about the the coming year, but also as you started to look at the future years. Um, I noticed that in our budget, we just got third quarter estimates in on the current year budget. And it looks like um, we will be running um, under budget in the police department, probably police line, at least in part because two positions weren't full. So can one dedicate that amount to the new program going forward? Can you do it in a way that it, it becomes excess in this year, goes into reserves, but comes back out as part of funding for a new program because we can use reserves that way. So that's a question on that pot of money. Um, uh, secondly, and I know Alyssa knows far more about this than I do, but the we just had a discussion in the meeting before about the community impact fund, the marijuana community impact fund and how restricted it is. It does say you can buy vehicles with it. It does say you can do mental health training with it. Again, it's around marijuana and it's more around drug, but at least some of these calls. So can any of that, and there may not be an answer to that, but can any of that be drawn on? Cause it's a pot of money that we haven't touched on. 
So I'll stop with those two questions. I have a question about the current budget too, but I just wanted to get those two in because I've been going back and forth with the budget, trying to think of how do we get the first year program running up, up and running and, and be ready to build on in year two and build on rapidly, but get a healthy enough start so we can really, as you said, be saying, how well is it working? Can we get everything in order? So I was looking for potential sources of additional money as we need them. Sean, do you want to help with that? Or do you, I'm happy to do it. I mean, um, yeah, Sean, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> so the first piece I think was, can we use the, the amount that the police department's coming in under budget this year for to support the program next year? Um, Potentially, I mean, that's not an ongoing revenue source. Again, that, that's sort of like using reserves to, to fund something, um, but potentially, again, that's gonna fall to free cash. And if there's a, a use we decide in the future that we need to pay for out of reserves, it, that could be an option. Um, again, we're gonna look, we were proposing to look at the grant first before we dip into that. But um, again, it's, it's an option for the, for the council to decide. Um, what was the second question, Kathy? Your marijuana Sorry. money, marijuana oh, money. Yeah, no, that's something we've talked about actually. Um, we're, we're trying to work on a, you know, we plan to come back to talk to the council about that money in the, I think it was gonna be in the summer or the fall, we were gonna have a more comprehensive discussion with the council about how to allocate that. Um, you know, our, our initial thoughts are that some of that money could go to support this program. Um, it could also go to support other mental health programming in town. And it can also, we also were thinking it could go to support some um, mental health programming at the schools or and some uh, substance abuse education at the schools as well. Um, so I think the answer is yes to that. And we wanted to have that conversation in the fall about the plan for using that money going forward. So can I, can I just follow up on both. So if those pots become available to greater or lesser extent in what you laid out as a first, I understand this is just the FY22. Um, does that potentially either expand to another responder position, expand to, and those decisions could be made in the spring um, because it's money that's being kind of held in a bucket to say we, we could draw on that money. So that was where I was thinking on. Yeah, yeah, the cannabis money is something that could be appropriated. Again, if we come in the fall and have that conversation and that's it's decided that we're gonna go down the route of using it to add a, um, another community responder, that's a decision that could be made in the, in the spring. Um, because that money we haven't included in the budget at all yet. And, and then the other pots, how long is the um, the current, the new federal money that you're, you've got that 250,000, that's a, that's expands over three years. So is that potentially a source for not Nick for, but FY23 and 24? Potentially um, again, so yeah, it goes till FY24 and it can even, depending on what you're doing, extend even a little bit beyond that. Um, there's gonna be a lot of needs for that money and this could be one of them. Um, that money is meant for, uh, if you read the, the eligible uses, it's meant for um, you know, COVID response and, and economic recovery and, and a lot of other issues. Um, but this could be one of them. The, the eligible use that we are considering when we talk about using those funds for this program is one that's called revenue replacement. And that use is capped and it's capped based on um, a calculation that you, you can show how much revenue you actually are down compared to where you were before COVID. Um, and so you, you do that calculation several times throughout the grant. So, you know, in this first year, we anticipate that number is gonna be a uh, potentially a larger number for revenue replacement because our revenues are down quite a bit from where they were pre-pandemic. Um, but as we go forward in the out years and as things start to recover, that number is going to shrink. So we don't know exactly how much will be available in year two or year three um, for that eligible use. But um, that is, again, that's something we were considering as part of this plan. Thank you. Steve. Thank you. And thank you for the presentation. And I, I was also very moved by the um, community service working group, I, the community safety working group presentation on Monday, I didn't say much then, but um, I do have some questions here. Some of them are kind of nerdy questions. So Massachusetts is one of the most heavily regulated states re regarding professions and occupations. Um, so my question really has to do with what actually is regulated by, like what are the things that 
somebody who's a sworn police officer actually have to do or, or a firefighter or an EMT. So since community responder, it seems like a relatively new kind of a job description in the Commonwealth. I'm just curious what those boundaries might be in terms of everything from licensing to union contracts to um, you know, federal standards. So that's, that's not a, necessarily a question that has to be answered now. Well, let, let, can, we, can we take a crack at it? Yeah, and I actually, I, if, can I babble away while sure. I, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, a friend of mine who's a, been a police chief in a number of communities turned me on to Sunnyvale, California and Kalamazoo, Michigan, obviously different states, which are um, communities which have cross training between the various community safety groups. So for example, police, fire, EMT, and maybe others, especially in Sunnydale, are uh, kind of, there's a unified approach where a police officer can go respond to uh, a fire call as a firefighter and you know, vice versa is how I understand that. So I'm just curious because creating another department causes inefficient, sort of inefficiencies. Um, I, I really am literally babbling here. And then the last thing I wanted to say is Obviously, a new fire department is on the capital priority list, but I hope that we, as we're thinking about community safety, obviously a new uh, fire building is very much part of the community safety complex, but it's possible that um, as we're, as this department matures or whatever we matures, that the fire department can be a reasonable a co-located space for the community responders. So that's my babbling, and I'd love to hear what Paul was going to say or anyone else. Yeah. So I just want so that you know, the, Tim Tim Nelson, our fire chief, has had um, some really creative ideas on how can we utilize the fire department to support this mission. And his team is very open to thinking about because they're all paramedics, and they're on duty twenty four hours a day. Um, what, what, you know, and so that, that's an opportunity that we should address. In terms of all the legal stuff, I'd look to either Scott or Mary Beth, who uh, Mary Beth is licensed social worker. Scott, of course, knows everything about policing. Do either or both of you want to address that? Do you want to go first, Mary Beth? Sure. There we go. Um, I, I guess I would, I would distinguish these positions as really more uh, focused on behavioral health management. If you look at the models that are out there, they are typically individuals who have expertise with mental health crisis, substance use, uh, poverty related issues, homelessness, food insecurity. So they tend to be more of an expertise with social work than individuals who are trained as law enforcement. And, and in many of the contracts, including CAHOOTS, it states specifically that the community responders are not law enforcement, nor are they authorized to act thereof. So for instance, uh, they couldn't, they couldn't uh, enforce a trespass order. They wouldn't do something like that. They would not serve somebody with a trespass order. They might respond to a trespass call to de-escalate. Their response and how they perform their work is very different and it's behaviorally based. And so that's, I just think, a, a sort of a primer of the distinction between those two facets. And what I also would know is that in all of the models that I have read and researched, and, and I used to teach a course, Mental Health and the Law. So I've spent many years, it's, it's a professional passion of mine, is that uh, the, these models are highly successful when they are collaborative. And by collaborative, it is everybody understands what the roles and functions are and the boundaries and limits and, and the specific expertise that each team brings. So an EMT brings a very specialized medical approach and, and the team, as they begin to work together and call and cross train, uh, you know, they learn when it is appropriate to maybe call in for assistance or to get back up, but they really are collaborative and that they tend to also have round tables. So once a month you would have uh, defense attorneys meeting with um, uh, the fire department, the police department, uh, community stakeholders, behavioral health providers, the community responders, and those individuals who are working with uh, those who tend to be served more frequently by these processes. So I don't, I don't know if that makes sense or answers in part what you're looking for. 
Scott, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, and I would just touch on, Steve, the um, specifics about a co-response or co-fire police response. I'm familiar with some in the South where there are fewer restrictions and fewer training responsibilities for police and fire. I'm not familiar with the Kalamazoo, Michigan one, but the mandates and licensing for police officers is ex extensive. And I know it is to some degree with the fire and Jimmy could jump on board, but you know, just the initial training for to become a police officer is 24 to 26 weeks of training. And then there's annual trainings that go along with that. And then additional annual in-service trainings of a minimum of 40 hours um, annually, and it's usually more around 70. So specific to firearms and first aid response and, you know, the district attorney's mandates as first line reporters and that sort of thing. It, it would be in a very difficult process to go through for either a fire op, a fireman or for a police officer to be cross trained. I don't know if we could do it. That makes sense. Thank you so much. From the fire part. Yeah. I, Tim, Tim, did you want to add? Yeah, I, I would I would agree, agree agree with that. You you see that a lot out in the, in the south and in the southwest. They're I mean they're called public safe, safe, safe safety officers. And really, what 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 you get is a high a high a high hybrid, and it's some it's almost a jack jack of all trades, but ma ma master of none. You really don't get a you really don't get the full flavor flavor, flavor of the public public of the of of a fire, 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 or a police officer with with that. Uh, it's it's it. The last time I I heard it, heard it's broad brought up was years years and years 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 ago here in in in, in Mass. And it, it's it's some something that that would would be tough 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 to get 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 through. We're a lot more. Uh, we're, we're we're a lot a lot. This state is a lot more strict in term term in terms of tra training and sort of certification than you'll find down down south or in the or in the, or in the, the south the south south southwest for each for, for each of those professions. So should we very much on to Shalini? Mm. Yeah, I'm uh, also full of hope and excitement um, that we are really working hard and thank you paul and the implementation team each one of you who's uh, putting in extra hours because i know this work is so important and so overdue and so really excited about that um my question last time was around uh, what kind of calls are going to go to the crest program and what i heard from the community safety working group last time and then from paul today is that LEAP will be doing that work for us. So that sounds really exciting to me. And when I went to LEAP's website, uh, that's a question I had was, there are two categories of calls. One were behavioral health calls. And they said, these are the ones that typically go to these programs is the behavioral health, which is lower risk calls related to mental health, addiction, homelessness. And the second was around quality of life. So disturbances, suspicious persons, trespassing. So the question was, um, sort of, you know, this idea that we want to make sure that this program is a success and which means that we want to be able to staff it fully because if people are feeling they don't know who to call and it's not so, you know, so, so do we have a sense of which category are we doing both at the same time or it seems like we may want to start with behavioral health first and uh, so which category are we starting with and the second question is, do we have um, a sense of how many that is like, do we have, will a staff of five people be enough? Because that seems really important that whatever we decide that we have the staff to be able to respond. So will five people be enough? And then the third thing I wanted to say was that, um, you know, as a person of color, I understand racism. I, you know, I'm from South Asia, so no way pretend that I understand uh, what Latina women go through or uh, black women go through. But I have experienced racism and I think it's a systemic thing and we cannot separate policing from the rest of um, you know, racism in our community. And so 
investing in a diversity officer is really important. So I'm happy to see that you have that position. But that being said, uh, I also heard the goal is that we want to make the crest successful and sustainable, which means we want to also keep increasing our revenues without burdening people with property taxes and so forth. And investing in an economic development director is really important because revenue will not grow on its own. And we really, really need someone to focus on that. Even if we plan to commit that this percentage of the revenue that will be generated from the economic development director goes to the Crest program or whatever, but, but we really do need to invest in an economic development director to make sure that we are creating new channels of revenue for our town. So that's all. So on the calls, do you, mm -hmm. Scott or Mike? I mean, you you had that conversation yeah. recently with Leap, I think. Yes, um, Shalini. So Captain Ting and I met for the third time with the Law Enforcement Action Partnership this morning, and we have previously sent them all of our call volumes, everything that we respond to. So they are beginning the process of nitpicking what each call means and, and what it entails. And um, they're doing this with a number of communities. That we might be the smallest community they're dealing with. <laughs> That's okay, they're, they're comfortable with that. So mm -hmm. this morning's meeting with Captain Ting and I involved trying to dig into the weeds, okay, what does this call actually mean? Now you didn't understand like noise disturbances. Um, how does that work? And what kind of a response would that be for a, for a university community. So we had to explain it could be anything from two people on a porch talking too loudly to 5,000 people at a, at a, you know, mega, mega party. So, you know, they're, we're trying to now go into the weeds and Captain Ting is um, really crunching numbers for them about what every call means, what the response would look like. And they've pretty much identified, it looks like maybe four or five categories of calls that we might be able to divert some, not all uh, calls to a Crest group. So for instance, not every, something simple like a well-being check, right? So a well-being check could be a parent who's calling because they haven't heard from their student for a day and a day and a half. And we get those types of calls. I, I, I texted my daughter and she hasn't responded to me. Could you check on her? That's simple, right? And then most recently we had one last week where nobody had heard from this person and they had been deceased for over a week. So there's differences where community responders could handle types of those types of calls. And, and then the dispatchers would need to do more um, in-depth, uh, I hate to use the word questioning, but getting more information from the callers about what exactly it is they're looking for for, 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 for a response. So. Um, I think there's going to be a lot more work that the LEAP group is going to be requesting of us and of probably other town departments. So they're going to be expanding who they're going to be talking to. Mm -hmm. And you have to remind me of the other two questions, Shalini. Yeah, uh, one was then, do we feel that five people will be enough? Mm -hmm. I think you have a budget for five mm -hmm. people will be enough to... So we see this as a pilot program and having it work at a small level and then being able to analyze it and evaluate it um, initially. And that's why, you know, it's a several month evaluation period that then would be looked at for higher, higher level of funding um, for FY23. I mean, one of the challenges for us is when do calls come in? It's, all, it's not just the type of calls, but also when do we tend to see those calls? We know that they, there's, there's a pattern typically for most calls. Mm -hmm. um, and what is the, the goal that we're doing? Are we saying we want to answer 100% of the calls or is 80% enough or is 50%? We, you know, we want to establish what is the right level of response um, that we are trying to achieve and what's the response time expectation. So I think when you're building the program, we want to set up the metrics so that we can say, is the program working or not? Is it not working because we didn't give it adequate resources? We need to add people so it does work better. It's, it's looking at a program, that, you know, as you're building a program, you want to make sure that it's, again, our metric is about, does it make the community feel safer at the end of the day because mm -hmm. we responded differently? And I think it will. I think the evidence from other communities is that it does. It doesn't mm -hmm. fix every problem and we don't claim that it will, but I think this is an important step. And the third was? 
about the economic development. Yeah, you, you know, I hear you on that. And, um, you know, it's, it's also an important position. You know, we will explore other avenues of funding to support that effort, that work. Um, you know, a, a year ago, uh, Dave Zomack, um, after the murder of George Floyd, we just said we are woefully in ill-equipped to really mm. process the importance of this because we're who we are, mm -hmm. and we didn't, and we didn't have the enough of our of the BIPOC mm -hmm. community available and present and in a decision-making role that would would have okay. they need we need we need that presence. I hear you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. yeah, Mandy. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm going to get back to money for a little bit because I appreciate the need to find an ongoing revenue source for funding of this. And so when I was doing my calculations on the police line budget, I know we froze two positions this year, but I also know four to five positions are open. Um, and in the budget, there's about on the policing line, there's about $4.8 million in salaries for approximately 48 positions, which averages out to about 100,000 a position. You said for the community services that you were moving two positions over, but only funded 130,000, which I assume are starting salaries for police officers, but the positions that became vacant were not being paid starting salaries. So I'm wondering, why the, those two positions equated only to 130,000 and not closer to 200,000. And then on top of that, if we have four positions open, um, is it possible to move those other two position salaries over to get closer to $400,000 given just the dividing of positions into amount of money in the salary line um, that would, would give us without even having to use the replacement funds or much less use of replacement funds um, under the ARPA or, or I'm not sure whatever it's called um, government you know federal funds to, to start doing that um, without you know without um, necessarily harming the police response for the next year because I know when you've got seven months of no response at all um, from this crest program because it takes time to bring up the, the police by default are doing those responses. So we can't, you know, transfer things over immediately and all. Um, but, but with that, you know, I, to follow up on Shalini's uh, point about are four to five employees enough, it sounds like you're starting with a one shift five days a week plan, um, maybe seven days a week plan. Um, so eight hours a day of, of doing this, if you're going to have all four employees working at the same time, if not, are we only, are we looking, given, given the CRESS, the Community Safety Working Group's proposal of two, two two-person teams per shift. So um, is the plan to start with essentially a third, you know, sort of one shift a day um, instead of two or three shifts a day, or is the plan to start 24 hours a day three days a week. And I understand some of these might not be be notified, but the question would be, is one shift enough for the CREST program to actually pilot it? Um, and then the third one is is for the chief, um, because I assume this, this determination would be similar for both programs, which is there is, in order to do a 24 seven force response and, and the, um, our, our Chief Nelson would also be able to do this. We need a certain minimum number of people because of vacations, because of, you know, there's just five people overall to cover 40, if they only work 40 hours a week, the number of hours in a week, you need a minimum of five overall, but they take vacation, they get sick. So in general, what is, if you want two people on duty at all times, do we have an idea of what the number, the minimum number of people to guarantee two patrol officers, to guarantee two firefighters or EMTs, to guarantee two press people are always on duty. Do we have an idea of what that number is? And I, I ask that because I'm trying to get an idea for CRESS whether the Community Safety Working Group's plan of 16 responders is, is, a, is an, a reasonable number because I don't actually know whether that would, can be enough for 24 seven service for two shifts 
type thing. So those are my initial questions. Thanks. Well, Paul, can I? Yeah. Sorry, Paul, can I jump in? Um, I can tell you that when we started at the dispatch center, we ran two people a shift on a four and two schedule, so you need nine people to cover that. But we ran into the problems you talked about. Anytime somebody's out, it leads to overtime. Somebody gets stuck working a 16 hour shift. Now they're sick the next day and it kind of compiles itself. We're up to 12. Um, there's formulas out there like relief factor formulas um, that with our staffing, it says we're supposed to have 15 people, which I think would be a little excessive. We'll take them if you got them. But um, so nine people, if you wanted to run a four and two schedule, um, eight hour shifts, four on, two off, you could make it happen with that um, as a starting point. And in terms of, you know, and that's assuming a four and two schedule, right? First off, um, which is what police typically work. Um, the other thing in terms of our, the pilot, we were looking at one, two, two responders on at a time. So two, sh not four at a time. So as our, for our pilot, we would look at two on a time. Uh, so 16 hours a day, roughly. We probably would need, we may need some uh, part-time uh, employees to support the weekend work and things like that. Um, the budget sort of, is more complex. Do you want me to, yeah, yeah, so the, the 130 was based off of um, two of the vacant positions or, or two of the sort of lower level positions. We didn't, weren't sure how the, some of the vacancies are at different levels. So we're not sure how those are gonna be filled over the coming years or some of the people on the lower level are gonna get pushed into those higher positions. Um, so the 130 was based off roughly two $65,000 positions. Um, the personnel line includes other things than sort of straight salary. So there's um, there's an overtime line in there. There's educational incentives, things like that. We didn't touch because they were sort of um, other than the forty thousand identified that we we uh, found that we could get rid of um, or shift out. Um, we didn't touch those because those are sort of unique um, on a year to year basis. But that's one of the things that once these two positions are gone, we'll reassess. Um, once these two positions are shifted, we can reassess and see if there's flexibility there. So a couple other things on that. So when, when a higher position person, paid person leaves, we always budget at the lower level so that, because a new person won't be stopping, they typically don't start at the beginning. And I think our beginning salaries are in the forties, I think for police officers someplace in there. Um, so I think that that's, that's one thing. Also just for FY22, um, the reality is when you're a town employee, um, you are not eligible for vacation for the first six months of your employment. So there wouldn't be any vacation permitted um, during that first six months, but that would have to be calculated. And like Mike said, because that will that will catch up on us pretty quickly. Um, and then we don't wanna be in an overtime situation because that's that's not the best place to be. And just to add um, one thing real quick, the, the positions we budgeted in the pilot program, we picked sort of middle of the road near the top for those positions, thinking that the skill sets might require that. Um, again, there might be flexibility there when we actually fill these positions based on the experiences um, of the people that fill them that um, they could come in higher, but they could also come in lower. Um, so there might be more flexibility there. Hey, uh, George. Thank you, Andy. Um, Paul, I like the approach you're taking here. It, it actually gives me some sense of optimism and excitement. And I think I share that with a number of my colleagues. Um, I'm not always felt that way and I hope it'll stay with me for a while. Um, I like the idea of establishing proof of concept um, that, and then evaluating after initial trial. Um, I like the collaborative approach that you're endorsing here where we're bringing all the major actors to the table and everybody's contribution is important and valued. Um, looking to other towns and communities, other agencies for help. Um, these I think are really um, excellent uh, ways to approach uh, this and I, I appreciate that. I do have, you know, when somebody says that, you know, then and then the other shoe, right? But um, I do share the concern, I think of a few others as been mentioned already. Um, I do think the loss of the uh, economic development director position is, is not, a good idea. Um, and that's something that, that we'll come back to at some later point, but I just want to note that. I understand the, the pressure to find funds and, and right now that maybe that's the only option you see, but I don't, I don't agree with that and I think it's not a, a good thing. Um, and I just have a quick question for the chief. I'm, I'm just curious, um, in this initial kind of program that, that you're proposing, some of the funding will come from uh, the loss of, it's described as uh, educational incentives. 
And I just wonder if the chief could just briefly describe what that means in practice, what is given up or lost when those yep. funds are taken from the police department and given to uh, uh, this program. Can I just jump on that one real quick? Yeah, um, so the, the educational incentives we're talking about here, it, they were literally over budgeted. That, that was something when we went back and we were answering a question for one of the finance committee members, um, we found a, a mistake in sort of the calculation of the edu educational incentives. So that 40,000 that we're moving out, it's not a loss of educational incentives for any of the officers. It's just, um, it's getting it to where it should be. Okay. Anything else, George? Uh, Evan? Yeah, and excuse if you can hear the lawnmower in the background. Um, so I want to back up Jordan Shalini's statement, and this probably comes as no surprise to you, Paul. Um, I understand the need for the DEI director, and I commend you for um, working to find a source of funding for that. I cannot accept that funding being through eliminating the economic development director position. You know, this position has been open for about a year and a half now. Um, and, you know, a lot of us have been nagging you about it for that entire year and a half and been frustrated at you dragging your feet at that. Um, I think a lot of us were willing to accept that during the financial uncertainty of COVID, it didn't make sense to add a new full-time staff position when we were trying to make sure we didn't have to lay off any other of our existing staff. Uh, but now that we're coming out of COVID and we're looking at economic recovery, this is the exact time that we need an economic development director. And my frustration is that we're sitting here trying to figure out how to fund new staff positions and new programs. And the reason that's difficult is we're trying to fund new positions and new programs from a budget that is already stretched to capacity, right? And so we've created this zero sum game where to increase funding for one department or to create new staff positions, some other department has to lose. And so in this case, you're arguing that we should fund the DEI director by defunding by 100% the economic development department, right? And that's an unfortunate situation for us to be in. And I think what Shalini pointed out is that an economic development director who does a good job who can look at increasing investment in Amherst, increasing local business uh, activity in Amherst, increasing redevelopment in Amherst can help grow our budget, right? So instead of fighting over all of this and having to move this from here to there, we can just grow the pot of money. And so we know, for instance, you know, a lot of folks might not like one East Pleasant Street, but the assessed value of that land went from 2.7 million to 19 million, right? So we had an incredible increase in tax money that probably is about what it costs to hire the DEI director. And so to me, it is short-sighted to eliminate the economic development director position to fund this other position when the economic development director position is one that can help grow our budget so we can continue to fund these new initiatives. So I understand it's sort of the easy option because it is a vacant position that has an amount of money attached to it that's about what you wanna spend I don't think it's a good option. So I'm going to ask you to reconsider that. And if we're, we really want to fund the DEI director position, I think we need to find another source of money because I don't think that this is a good option. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Lynn? I think unmuting helps. Um, first of all, I, I'm glad to have an opportunity to look at this tonight both from the perspective of what we originally saw and what we're now seeing. But more importantly to me is looking at it from the perspective of what the Community Safety Working Group has just talked about, what they've learned and what they've brought to us. And then starting to see that incorporated into how Paul is thinking about this. Some of you know my background and some of you probably don't know my background. I've, met, I've written grants and held and used or uh, worked with grant teams that have done $30 million proposals over a five year period and won them. So what we have now is an enormous amount of research. We have a committee that has already formed the thinking about this. And I already know there's two state funding opportunities out there for exactly these kinds of programs. So I sit here today and think of us as putting a serious base on the ground 
around we can now start building. And I know grant, fund is, grant funding is risky, okay? Because it goes away, but it gives us an opportunity to take this, to build on it, to add to it, to grow it even faster than how Paul is laying out because this kind of money is now available. It's not 10 years from now. It's not five years from now. It's available now. And because of all the work that the community safety group has done, and because of all the work the chief has done, and Paul and his staff have done, and the networks we're now connected to because of this, we're sitting in a gorgeous place. I wish I could write a proposal today using everything that it already is on paper in Amherst about this, because the pieces are all there. And with, this, with the funding that the town will put forward, we have the opportunity to grow this program, not just as a pilot, but as a longstanding program. I say that, I also have to say, I do not support not funding the Director of Economic Development. So I'm gonna encourage that we find other funds for that as well. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna call on Pat next because I'm trying to get to people who haven't been I've got a duplicates until the end. And uh, at some point, I'll want to bring in the community safety working group. But uh, anyway. Um, Thank you. Um, I feel very lucky that we have a chamber um, and a bid that collaborate with the town so directly. And I feel like with their support, we can continue to be creative around economic development. What concerns me is um, sort of the uh, replacing that position with a position that can creatively uh, bring our community together, that can heal our community. Um, can, it seems to me to be much more important than an economic development director right now. Um, an economic de development director didn't bring in the eruptor lab, which is a potential possibility that we have. And with that coming here, we have the opportunity for other kinds of uh, groups like that too, who are gonna be doing research and collaboration and innovation. Um, Nobody brought that in except the guy uh, who wanted it uh, and Stan Rosenberg. The, uh, we, need, we need to address racism. That to me has much more value than anything else right now. Uh, and I wish I could be more articulate. I have all kinds of notes here, but it's not working to try to follow them. Um, <laughs> Somebody in another context said, follow the money. I'm going to say the money is there and getting an economic de development director in a year, in another year, waiting another year so that this program can get off the ground so it can do the kinds of grant searching that Lynn is talking about seems to me to be the most important investment we can make in our community. And uh, so I wish I had a, yeah, a more detailed or specific uh, replacement for the economic development director. It is not as important a position given the willingness we have to have developers come in and everything else. That is not what's gonna secure the future of this community. Uh, but the, uh, this program and a, a d director of equity and <laughs> Inclusion will help the development of this community. So uh, I would urge my fellow counselors to um, try and stick to questions at this point, though I appreciate uh, wanting to make statements too, but we are wanting to make sure that we focus on questions also. Uh, Dorothy? Well, I do want to make a statement. Um, I acknowledge the good points that have been brought up, 
but I trust that the same practical idealism that has shaped this proposal will solve these problems. I totally approve of this thoughtful cooperative plan and I do disagree. I don't think our budget is stretched to the max. Um, people who manage our money have many wise ways of dealing with money. So I'm just saying I accept this proposal with faith and confidence that the things that need to be corrected or ironed out will be. I think it's fabulous. I was shocked and surprised when I read it to get such a detailed practical plan that I can see making a great difference in the lives of many people. Darcy? Yeah, um, I just wanted to say briefly that um, I agree with Pat on the issue of the, the economic director. I think that we, you know, we're one of the very, very few communities in Massachusetts that has a bid. Um, and um, so we have a bid and a chamber and, and um, you know, they provide a lot of advocacy on economic development. So that is a good thing. Um, and I just wanted to also make a comment that um, uh, I'm excited that we're working with this Harvard group, looking at best practices in other communities. And I would just uh, suggest the possibility of Ithaca because they are on the cutting edge in this area. Um, they have a population very similar to ours, their college community. Um, and, you know, we're looking at them with climate action and with zero waste. And I, I see that they're also on the cutting edge of reparations. Um, and they have a, a, a new plan around that. Um, and lastly, I have a question and that is, um, I'm just wondering what would be, and maybe you've already mentioned it, forgive me if you have, is what would be the projected FY23 budget for this and how would it differ from what the community um, safety working group is putting forward for, for the overall budget? Um, yeah. Are you looking at me through Zoom? I can see oh, yeah. your eyes looking at me to, to answer that. Um, so to maintain the four community responder positions, a director position and the uh, administrative support position for a full year, um, we would have to add about 300 to $350,000 to the budget. Um, the big reason why that's a little bit higher than what we're adding for FY22 is because the pension costs associated with all these positions, we don't we're not expected to, we're not anticipating having to pay it in FY22 because if they're not employed as of October then we don't have to pay the pension for that year um, the following year they'll be here the full year so the, the full pension impact will hit um, and then insurances will be the full year and and salaries will be the full year so again it'll it'll vary based on who we hire and what where they are on the wage scale and if they take insurance but um, we're estimating between 300 to 350 thousand to maintain the four full-time responders plus the director, plus the um, administrative support position. And then for every additional community responder that uh, the town would like to add, ballpark of about $90,000, if we use the same sort of um, estimates as we use for the existing positions, um, of about 60,000 for wages, and then the, the rest of it for benefits. So how does that differ from what, the, what was being requested by the community safety working group? Well, I look, do you have their yeah. proposal? I think it was 12, but I could be off yeah. on that. 12 community responders? Yes, That's 12, 12 full-time responders, four staff per shift, three full-time shift responder supervisors, and one uh, director plus one full-time administrative assistant. So that was just for the program. That, that doesn't count the dispatch thing, uh, dispatch options. So um, yeah, they're, they're, they're their program would be much more robust than what the pilot would look like. And if we wanted to go to there in year two, um, it would be significant investment. So year two meaning FY23. Three, uh, right. Uh, okay, thank you. Anything else, uh, Darcy? No, that's it. Okay, so we had four uh, counselors who've previously asked questions. I'm going to call on them and then in the meantime, um, as that is reaching its conclusion, 
Um, I'll ask that Athena bring in uh, members of the uh, community um, safety working group. I know that both co-chairs have their hands up and I wanna be able to um, have them be able to ask questions about the proposal and um, give their thoughts on the subject too. So uh, we'll do the four people who've uh, previously asked questions as counselors and then uh, in the meantime, we'll be ready to uh, bring in people from the uh, working group. Uh, Kathy? Um, thanks, Andy. Um, I I have uh, one is a question, as I it's it's a two part question. One we do have two positions are being moved out of the police department. There are potentially three vacancies. So my question is: there a possibility we could hold one position for a year or for half a year to see whether we as you, as, or three quarters of a year, so you see what happens to the workload and the response. Um, you know, I was told earlier that there's a potential excellent hire, a person of color trained. In, so I'm not talking about all, but hold one. And does that potentially provide money toward the end of the year and ongoing then? Um, the second is Amherst College and UMass. Um, I, you haven't had time, I don't think, but, Darcy's question of looking at FY23, FY24, um, is there some potential um, from the wealthier of them as Amherst College is now teaching uh, anti-racism, structuralism, they have their own history. Would they, in this case, ever um, do some pilot money? I know Bernie doesn't like me to use payment in lieu of taxes, so just some generosity money <laughs> to Amherst, you know, so you have, probably haven't had a chance to talk to them. And then, Andy, you said no statements, but I do have one to make. I don't think we have a proof of concept for a one-person economic development position. When I'm looking at studies, small towns with big ideas and community economic development, they were often collaborative efforts with a BID, a chamber, a university. They weren't hire one person and oh my gosh, what you get. I don't think there is a proof of concept in a small town of a person and we've known we've been trying to do this. So I think we have more, a lot of potential work. We've got incredible people in town, including at the university who teach entrepreneurism to put for, to think of that as a collaborative effort. And we've got Chris Bresto and Dave Zomek. We've got people that have been thinking about this. I don't think we have a proof of concept that that slot just as defined would bring home. Lynn's idea of a grant getter Absolutely. Um, but so I, there isn't a proof of concept on that position. I think we know a program like this it could be successful. So my first were on future funding streams. Questions? So uh, in terms of working with the university and the colleges, um, what I was thinking about is that I think they're going to walk down a similar path and that might, there might be uh, ways we can collaborate with them. Um, and utilize and have some efficiencies of scale. I don't know if that's true or not, um, but that's what I was thinking about. And, and we could always, you know, a lot of the calls that these people, the, the responders might be responding to might be um, students. And that would be something that we could track and then go to the university and say, pony up, it's your turn. You know, this is, this is what you need to do to meet this need. Um, I think in terms of staffing for the um, for the program, I think we we want to, you know, if the first order of business is is to look at the timing of the calls and to look at the volume of the calls. We need to really look at dig down into those calls that we think as many as we can to divert and see how many of those are successfully diverted, and and see how that's working out in real time. Um, and I think, you know, next year it will be a good year because we should be back to normal, and we hope that. Um, that will give us a, a realistic um, assessment of what the need is. Thank you. Uh, shall I? Um, I just want to clarify that I am not saying that uh, DEI, uh, the diversity of uh, the economic development director in lieu of uh, the diversity, I strongly believe we need both. Um, and 
if we don't have a diverse uh, an economic development director as kathy was mentioning we don't need one we need then a committee those towns that don't have the directors they have an economic development committee to just assume that the bid will do our job no they're doing their job but they're not going to do the town's job of finding up the kind of opportunities we want, the kind that we're hearing about, the kind of development we want. BID is not going to do that. They are doing an amazing job, but they're not doing our job. And and the other thing is we have amazing staff, but each one is their plates are so full. Like Chris is doing hell of a job with zoning and planning and Dave is doing so many things. So we do need a, a focused look at that. However, that should not be at the cost of, because if you had to choose, I would definitely choose a diversity officer. There's no doubt we have a need for that, but I'm saying let's look for both. The question I had was about when you mentioned allocating 30,000 of ARPA funds for the diversity position and an existing half full-time position. So what does that look like? Um, sure. Yeah. So we have an existing staff person who uh, is, works part time in the town manager's office and part time in the human resources. And what the intent is with that that thirty thousand dollars is to elevate that person to be a DEI coordinator role, not the director role, in addition to the director. So we would have someone who's mm. already been on the town staff, who's been work doing a lot of work in our equity uh, core equity team, uh, and has been just getting rave reviews. And so we want to mm -hmm. sort of carve that out as an opportunity. For this person got it thank you okay um i noticed that we had one counselor who's uh raised her hand and not been recognized previously sarah thank you andy um so in thinking this out first i want to say that i do think this was a tremendous amount of work and so much care has obviously gone into this and I am really impressed. Um, so I don't want my next com comments to make it seem like I'm thinking, oh, well, you just didn't do enough because I don't think that at all. Um, my question is sort of a practical one in what we've heard from people who have called and written, um, made comments is that, you know, there are people in our community that don't feel comfortable calling the police. And I, what, I'm, what I'm hearing, and obviously we don't know yet, but is that there could be an incredible amount of people who called just for someone who is from Cress. Mm -hmm. So I know that we have to start out somewhere, but I was, I worry a little bit. I'm wondering like how, at what point will we start looking at how many calls are actually people who just want Cress and would rather not have the police if there's a direct number. And if those become an overwhelming number of people, right? If someone is like, no, I need help with, I'm just gonna use it, you know, I don't know. They need help with something that they do not want a police officer to mm -hmm. respond to because your Cress officers are already out. And that becomes a, a something that happens all the time. I'm worried about the frustration that people will feel and I'm I'm just wondering how quickly the town can then start taking that information in and trying to shift things around because I I wouldn't want the opposite to happen that people are feeling like they had the option for Cress but they don't really so I'm just wondering how how flexible the town is going to be in looking at the information that comes in yeah, I don't have an answer for that. I think, you know, I think the, the working group has been pretty explicit that they want a separate line uh, that somehow gets managed. I'm not sure how that would work. I know that they've had independent conversations with um, dispatch about different ways to approach that. Uh, some ideas have been just, can we just have a cell phone that goes directly to a Crest employee? And uh, I don't know the answer on what, what that means in terms of, uh, you know, just make sure that if a call comes in, it's, it's responded to properly. And it's and so we aren't dropping calls when someone's in crisis. Um, so, and that's why I said, I think that we may see an uptick in calls from people who have are not gonna call 911. We've heard a lot of people say, I'm never gonna call 911, but I might call this because I do have needs. And so uh, we don't know that until we start to roll it out and see what it looks like. Melissa? 
Thank you. I'm trying to figure out how to say this fast, and I really appreciate being recognized a second time. I'm very happy to recognize the work of a current employee that's done, in so, done so many wonderful things in so many ways. So pleased to see us grow our own. I've shared that with Paul individually as well. Um, I want to make clear that I firmly believe we don't have to choose between the two positions. It, pitting those two positions against each other was a mistake. It should not have been presented to us this way. I live in the real world where Amherst College and UMass, in addition to all the things they do indeed bring to our small town, we wouldn't exist if it wasn't for them. They do not and will not ever pay what our residents wish they would pay, despite all our efforts and many approaches. Yes, certainly sometimes we come up with a cool thing and we might very well get them to invent to invest in a cool thing on a one-time basis. And that has happened, but we need to not depend on that. We need to figure out which thing that is, sort of like applying for a grant. And reflecting back to what everybody's been saying about how we need money to do the things we wanna do, we don't bring in enough of that money with the staffing we have now. Yes, the eruptor is welcome, but it's a complete one-off. And I don't wanna mess up the Crest program. I don't want to slow down this amazing program in years two or three because we say, well, you know, we haven't had that new growth coming along. We don't have the money to do the things we need to do because we've talked about repeatedly how our costs go up every year. I'm also going to say very bluntly in a way that I'm sure is going to offend any number of people that we have a very poor history of diversity initiatives with our hires going back over 20 years when we had a human rights director that was a part-time position, then we had combined human rights, human resources directors, very little progress on many issues was made. Amazing progress has been made with, an, with a current staff member and with the core equity team that was not made over many years of hires that were not clear on what they were supposed to be doing. Depending on our terrific chamber and bid is not a long-term reality. It's the particular team we have had in the last couple of rounds. It's not always been true of the chamber. It's not always that we haven't always had a bid. And so to say that they could just take care of it just doesn't make sense. We can do better. We cannot do better doing things the way we've always done them. Putting out our standard job description for a diversity and equity inclusion officer is not going to get us what we want. Putting out our standard job description is not going to get us the economic development director that we want. I know that we can do better at this. I know that if we send out the standard things, none of us is gonna see what we want. So what I don't expect to have answered tonight because it certainly wasn't part of the presentation, but soon is how we're going to do a better job with that. And hearing that you're going to have slightly different people at the table maybe will help, but it won't change our track record, which is poor. So we need to do better and we need both positions and we can find a way to fund it. And I know Andy will love it when I say, take it out of OPEB for a couple of years. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna recognize Mandy as the last counselor for this section of the meeting. And then I'm gonna uh, ask the co-chairs of the working group um, about whether they would like to convene, their, uh, convene a meeting and uh, um, how they wanna proceed. But may it, so Mandy. Thank you so much for recognizing me and I'll try to be really quick. I'm, I'm just thinking about this $350,000 a year. Um, every year, you know, we, if we fund FY22, you've already stated we need about 300 to 350 to keep the same level of staffing in FY23 and then adding essentially two, two person shifts a year to get up to 12 people, which would be, you know, that it looks like we're planning on finally getting to 12 people in FY25, um, assuming that we only add about $350,000 a year to this program, that would keep four people at FY23, eight at FY24, 12 at FY25, which would be the first year that, given my previous question, that we could likely staff 24-7. Um, if I'm doing all of my math right quickly, and I'm looking at the projected budget that you did, and you projected out FY23, four, five, and six, and we're only projecting an addition of 500 to $670,000 a year on the town side in those three years. Um, and so I, I'm not sure where it's coming from <laughs> to also keep all the rest of the salaries up. So, you know, I, I, I think we need a, I'm hoping we have a better idea in another six months where we're going to get it the next 
FY23, four and five, including, and this is where my request comes in, most years we have a surplus. Uh, FY20, it was $1.6 million, um, according to your budget document on page 45. I didn't have time to go back. Has there been an analysis of where that surplus is every year um, to see whether we are actually over budgeting some parts and departments and why we keep getting, I, I'm not upset about a surplus, I'd much rather have a surplus, but if we need an extra $350,000 a year and we're regularly one, running one to one and a half or more million dollars in surplus a year, we should be analyzing why we're running those surpluses to see if there's a reason for that, that we could transfer the money. Paul, do you want me to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think one piece of the budget is we're not predicting how many positions will be added in FY23. Um, we're giving you the number. We know that there will be have, the decisions will have to be made in FY23. And we imagine that the data analysis that'll be done in FY22 will inform what happens for FY23. So I just want to be clear that we are not, we gave you that number so you, you know, so that we can estimate, but we're not predicting where it will go in FY23. Could go up more than two positions or not? I don't know. Um, and then the, I know the you know, one to one and a half million sounds like a lot, but when you're talking about an $80 million budget, you know, you're talking about two or 3%. Um, you know, Sonia can weigh in if she wants, if she's been here longer than I, if she's noticed any trends, but I would say two to 3% is not a terrible thing on an $80 million budget. Um, and that's one of the areas where we just had our bond rating um, updated. That was noted as a particular strength of the town is our strong budget performance. And that helped us get a, maintain our AA plus and helped us get lower, you know, a, a a 1% interest rate on our $10 million bond, which will save the town money going forward. Um, and it's also what's helped us build up our, our reserves so that we have funds for the four, you know, to, to do the four building project planning and all that. Um, so we can look at it, but I'm, I'm just reluctant to, you know, try to budget um, more aggressively. If we see any areas where we feel like we're overly conservative, we can certainly take a look at it. But um, I think we generally try to justify everything we budget. Um, Sonia, do you want to weigh in at all on that? Sure. Um, in the on the revenue side, the surpluses that come from there a lot of times are for years we are getting about three hundred thousand dollars a year for Medicare Part D, and that doesn't get budgeted; it just falls to free cash. But then we have to vote that from free cash into the OPEB fund, so that doesn't get budgeted for. And um, there's a lot of things like that. If we're going out for a bond, sometimes we get pretty decent bond premiums. Um, we budget all our revenues very conservatively. Uh, for operational turnbacks, that's mainly from staff turnover. And also we have to budget for what the, we think the cost is gonna be for that year. We might have like property and casualty insurance. It was pretty high at one point in the year we decided to, to bid for it and we saved a bunch of money on that. So that gets turned back on the savings. So we try to constantly bid out things and, and get savings, but we can't not budget for it because you can, you can't have a budget deficit. So there's a lot of there's a lot of moving parts to that. And we, we can pretty much give you the detail of what got turned back. And if you go back to the um, quarterly reports that are on the accounting website, if you go back to the end of year ones every year, you pr pretty much get a detail of what got turned back and why. I think one of our missions if to bring this new department to the council would be a funding plan to show how we possibly could fund it and what it would look like. Yeah, thank you. So I want to segue to uh, Brianna and Alicia as the uh, uh, co-chairs of the community uh, safety working group. I welcome uh, you to the meeting. Do you need to call your meeting to order? Do you, uh, do you feel that's necessary? And uh, as first question. Hi, Andy, thank you for recognizing us. I am more than comfortable to call the meeting to order, if that's okay. Okay. But before I do so, I just wanna mention, Paul, in your slideshow, you included CSWG reps being a part of the implementation team. So I felt a little bit offended that me and Ms. Walker as co-chairs and other CSWG members who have worked months on this project with consultants were in the audience while you all were having a conversation about CRESS and asking questions that we may have been able to answer more appropriately. So I just wanna say that before we get started. Yeah, well, thank you. 
Sorry that uh, it, it was difficult to arrange to, to figure out how to do this meeting. So I, I apologize too. Um, but uh, how, how do you, uh, how would you like to proceed now? Um, it's because uh, obviously we wanted you to hear the conversation and the questions from the council and we wanted to make sure that you um, had an opportunity then to provide input on the information that we've received from the questions and answers that you've heard. Well, first I'd like to call the meeting to order and I'm sure from their community safety working group members, I saw several of them had their hands up. And as I can imagine, um, some of us have questions for you and I'm sure we can answer questions more appropriately if council members wanna ask us directly as we've been again, working on this for months. So at this time, I'm just gonna call the meeting to order and call each member who's here. Um, my name is Brianna Owen and I'm calling this meeting to order as the vice chair of the community safety working group. Governor Baker's March 12th order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law allows us to hold this virtual meeting of the working group meeting with the finance committee. Given that we have a quorum present, I'm calling the May 27th meeting. Um, I will call upon each member at that time. You should unmute yourself and say present. This is gonna indica indicate that I can hear you and you can hear me. Um, please unmute your mic after saying um, present. Ms. Ferreira. Here. Mr. Vernon Jones. Present. Ms. Walker. Present. Uh, Ms. Bowman. Present. Ms. Pat. Yeah. And I believe, do we Here. have Mr. Cage? He's in the audience right now with his hand raised. Can we bring Mr. Cage in? Um, is he listed as a different name than Darius Cage? Darius Cage. Yeah. He's he was there. just in the audience. Oh, oh he doesn't have his hand up. I see him now. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cage, sorry for um, your late arrival. If you could just unmute your mic and say present so that we could get the meeting started. Present. Thank you. So now I'd like to pass the mic over to Ms. Walker. Um, and I'm sure other community safety working group members have comments and questions about this budget. And we also prepared a presentation emphasizing why the budget we made is so vital. Thank you, Ms. Owen. Uh, so I just wanted to let you guys know that we came here today under the impression that we were gonna be able to present our recommendations to the budget to the finance committee. Um, I also wanted to say that to host an entire conversation surrounding our recommendations without having us be in the conversation is extremely disrespectful and silencing. We have spent months on this work and we are the experts. We cannot create something efficient for our community if we do not listen to our community members and have them at the table. This is our work and we came to present to you. And so I'm hoping that although it was not in the agenda to present that we can screen share at this time so that we can have our voices be heard and have um, our recommendations be not interpreted by you all, but given to you directly from our group. As you proceeded, um, just to um, be conscious of the fact that everyone here heard the presentation on Monday, um, and we welcome building upon it, and uh, um, please proceed. Thank you, Andy. Um, the presentation is slightly edited from Monday's presentation. We are aware that most of you have seen it before, um, but we want to, there are there's some information that will be repetitive and this is for emphasis um, because there is clearly still a large lack of understanding. So we're going to start um, again from the beginning um, and I will pass it back over to Brianna. So at this time, I wanna, I don't wanna reintroduce the entire community safety working group, but I want to read their names so that you all have an idea of who is on our group um, and can put a face to the name. So we are the community safety working group, um, Tashina Bowman, Darius Cage, Deborah Ferreira, Pat Oniwipaku, Brianna Owen, myself, um, Russ Vernon Jones, Alicia Walker, and um, Paul Wiley, who resigned. 
I want to I want to emphasize our charge because it seems like it's being lost in the conversations that were had before we were um, put onto the meeting. So the community safety working group was assigned the following purpose to a make recommendations on alternative ways of providing safety services to the community and b to make recommendations on reforms to the current organizational and oversight structures of the Amherst Police Department. We were specifically charged with studying complex issues of delivering community safety services to ensure racial equity collecting data from people's experiences in Amherst, engaging the community most impacted by policing to develop alternatives and identify solutions to diagnose problems, investigating existing alternative models and programs for providing community safety services, examining existing town funding priorities regarding safety services, exploring models of resident oversight departments and recommending reforms to the current organizational and oversight structures of the current Amherst Police Department. Again, I want to bring up the intention of our recommendations because I've heard a lot about the economic position being talked about in this meeting. And I just wanna emphasize how important equity in the town is and how invaluable an equitable town is. So we want to point out that the community safety working group was intentional about the recommendations we made. The recommendations have two goals, to ensure that any public safety response is anti-racist, equitable, just, and fair and that we offer preventative services that get at the root of assisting our residents to avoid necessitating public safety involvement in the first place. The CSWG finds the historical context of white supremacy in Amherst extremely relevant to our work and to the town's commitment to dismantle white supremacy. The founding of Amherst is based on genocide. Amherst's legacy is controversial due to his expressed desire to exterminate the race of indigenous people during Pontiac's war and his advocacy of biological warfare in the form of gifting blankets infected with smallpox as a weapon. Our group is well aware that Amherst was once home to slave owners, was once home to documented redlining, and once home to primarily white schools. This history has manifested into the community we are living in now. By budgeting and financially supporting these initiatives, the town in the long run, and maybe even in the short run, will invest in the future, which will be a blacker, browner, more linguistic diverse than it is now. Additionally, investments in a more diverse and inclusive town assures an influx of created, entre creative, entrepreneurial, and younger residents. Historically, deeds were restricted to not allow certain residents to reside in certain areas. Black and brown families were pushed to less desirable areas like housing complexes, and today the demographics are not much different. Modern day redlining and the raise in rent continue to keep black and brown low income families in these same areas if they aren't forced out of Amherst completely. Many social service organizations that we connected with let us know that their employees travel from outside of Amherst to work here due to the unfeasible rental prices. Many town staff also do not reside in the city of Amherst, perhaps due to the high housing prices as well. This provides further insight on the disconnect in services being offered in this town. How does redlining and the rise in rental prices in Amherst influence current policing methods and outcomes? The tendency of low income working class and students with families is to access housing through apartment rentals. And as you can see from the chart, a large portion of APD calls are officer initiated and with the highest concentration being on one street in particular and located in apartment complexes. A further breakdown of the data shows the difference in police conduct between certain complexes and single resident areas. And if you focus specifically on police initiated calls, these disparities are very clear. The APD uses community policing models that include practices of surveillance and patrols which differ by neighborhood in terms of frequency and types of calls. With one of the methods being to identify specific problem oriented areas of town and direct patrols to those areas. This has resulted in the profiling and over surveillance of certain communities and in turn certain individuals. Nationally, our research has shown that community policing has contributed to the death of BIPOC persons and not their safety. And if you focus specifically on police initiated calls, these disparities are very clear. The APD, oh, I apologize. That was a repetition. Um, Brianna, can you go to the next slide, please? On May 25th, 2020, George Floyd, a 46 year old black man was murdered at the hands of the Minneapolis police. The repetition of these egregious incidences sparked national and local movements. 
organizations and the advocacy of local groups like Defund 413, Racial Equity Task Force, Reparations for Amherst, and the youth of BLM have been doing tremendous work to bring education and awareness to inequities in policing and in our town. As a response to the national and local uprising on June 1st, 2020, the town council adopted a resolution affirming the town of Amherst's commitment to end structural racism and achieve, achieve racial equity for black residents. And in order to commit to the affirmation, the town manager was assigned a goal that would help to specify what steps could be taken to help position Amherst in the direction of change. These are the goals that were set for the town manager. Our first recommendation is to create a BIPOC-led youth empowerment center and a BIPOC cultural center. Quality after-school programs designed with BIPOC teens in mind have shown to support and increase academic achievement and play a role in reducing other disparities. Youth programs promote positive social behaviors and emotional development and strengthen meaningful relationships between youth and community members. Culturally responsive mentoring, which operates within a framework of understanding of the social and cultural context in which youth live, provide added benefits to support their health and well being. Research indicates youth do better after therapeutic interventions rather than punishing ones. And when we limit the reach of the justice system into their lives, whether we intervene before or after they mess up. BIPOC led spaces serve as a mean of establishing community safety and in order for local governments to strengthen community safety and re reduce over reliance of the police. I know we talked about the statistics um, on Monday, but I just wanna emphasize again that the district is made up of over 50% of students who identify as BIPOC and between 2007 and 2017, Latinx students increased in the elementary schools by 30%. Um, one thing that really stood out to me from Elisa Brewer's comment is um, the town doing the same thing and not seeing new results. I saw in the PowerPoint presentation that we were suggested to work with the, the school systems family center. And while I think that's great, I also think that there's a reason why this group was put together. We were put together to make new ideas because the old ones were not giving you the new results you wanted. Our second recommendation is to create a well-funded Department of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. A department, a department of Diversity, Equity, and inclusion, and inclusion elevates the role of DEI into the hierarchy of town administration. It prioritizes consideration of inclusion and equity throughout hiring, training, housing, policies, planning, leadership, the environment, and the economy. It improves decision-making that better represents all communities and is less likely to suffer from unintentional blind spots and biases. It assures a more equitable allocation of public resources to all communities, not just a few, reduces staff turnover and increases employee engagement and awareness, and it builds community trust in town and offers more options for BIPOC and AAPI community members to be seen, seen as well as heard. Um, our next recommendation is to create an Amherst Oversight Board. And I know there's been a lot of kickback as to why we are requesting $10,000 for each member to receive as a stipend. And I just wanna communicate with you all that um, not all people in Amherst are able to serve on town boards and do this work without some form of financial compensation for the shifts that they're missing at work, the cost of childcare and other related expenses. By, compensate, by compensating people appropriately, it will allow for diversity to be on this board, including racial, ethnic, gender, class diversity, thereby allowing those who are often marginalized and Im impacted most by policing to sit on this board. And this will play a crucial role in overseeing and monitoring both the Amherst Police Department and the CREST program. We need to ensure that it is a critical task that isn't less left to the hands of a majority white board. We need to be conscious of the barriers that have stopped members from diverse groups from being able to be on the town council, the school committee, and other committees, which most often correlates to money and time. Our fourth recommendation is to create the CREST program.
Um, a lot went into the development of creating Crest. So as you know, that we did take into consideration all of the community feedback, but we also did a lot of research. And so the research um, that we started with was investigating other models that existed in other towns. We did look at Eugene or the Cahoots Crisis Assistance Helping Out on the Streets program. We looked at Albuquerque Community Safety Alternative and the Denver Star Support Team Assisted Response. Um, in terms of in terms of getting us into the direction of assessing what needs could work specifically for Amherst. And then just in regards to a comment that was made by another council member, um, we did also look at Ithaca, New York and what they are doing there in our research. Um, our fifth recommendation is to reduce the size of the Amherst Police Department. CRESS is an alternative safety service to the Amherst Police Department. And so I just really want to emphasize this because I, I hear this getting lost a lot in the conversation. Our specific task was to come up with an alternative so that the people who the police do not work for have someone to call. This is not a mental health service, although it will be addressing some mental health needs that are currently being addressed by the police department. This is not a social service, although they will be providing social service like things to the community. The Crest program, once fully funded, resourced and staffed, will lessen the need for the Amherst Police Department. With the shifting of nonviolent calls to the Crest program, the Amherst Police Department officers will no longer need to operate at full capacity. The funding of Crest will reduce the APD and lessen profiling of BIPOC and AAPI residents and persons visiting Amherst. And I, we added this slide because we wanted to clarify information around the reduction of APD officers. Um, we're not asking for an immediate cut in officers this year. We're asking that positions stay, stay as they are so we can develop CRESS, which is leaving the APD at 44 officers with one officer who is in the process of retirement until the CRESS program is fully funded, resourced, and staff. The CRESS program, once, is, once up and funded, will take an estimated 20 to 30% of calls from the APD um, and the APD will not need overtime in absence of those positions being frozen because Crest will be responding to these calls. Our sixth recommendation is to continue the ongoing work of the Community Safety Working Group. Um, it is obviously crucial that the CSWG continues for a number of reasons. Um, I would say one of the biggest ones just after attending this meeting is so we can continue to connect with the community and create new ways to get new results. What, what has been done hasn't been working. These are new ways that will get new results. Um, and we also need to stay together to be a part of the details and planning as the CREST program and other recommendations come into fruition. This is the budget that we put together to make these recommendations successful. We have used a number of uh, metrics such as the non-union non um, town of Amherst salary scale and also using Indeed as a way to look at the salary ranges for what we're asking from Crest responders and various positions. So this is our budget for the Crest program. And I know you guys all had this in your packet so I won't leave it on screen for too long. And then this is our budget for the Department of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and also the operating expenses for, the, um, for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, we are also able to compare the budget that we're asking to to similar town departments because um, there's been this huge this huge discussion over where the money is coming from and whether we're asking for too much money. So I just wanted to put the side by side comparison so you can keep that in mind while while trying to come while trying to understand where our budget was put together. So as you can see, it's the Amherst Police Department budget and then the Crest Responder budget, the Communication Center staff, and then the Crest Dispatch personnel, and so on and so forth. I'll leave this on screen for a little while. I know I sent it all to you all beforehand as well.
Um, we kept the slide in order to just give some suggestions that we had in, in terms of where funding can come from or where we can look more into funding these recommendations. Um, consider decreasing the $7 million budget of the Amherst Police Department. Use revenue generated by marijuana dispensaries. Federal stimulus money from the CARES um, Act funds have been discussed, and so we would like to look more into that as well. Use the money held in reserves for the emergency of racism and the continued harm it imposes on our community and the $4 million that is held in the town's uh, free cash fund. At our last meeting, we urged the town council to reflect on the, on the crossroads we are at in forging a new path towards our dream destination of a town that works for all of its residents and centers the most historically disenfranchised. I want you all to take a moment to reflect on your commitment to racial equity personally and in your role. What side of history will you be on? What legacy will you leave behind? And what doors will you open? Let me paint this picture for you. Amherst is a town where all residents thrive, where families, young people, individuals, the elderly, the disabled, and BIPOC residents have the knowledge and access to the resources that they deem important and essential to their well being and the well being of their families a place where those in crisis know and trust who and where to turn, where power sharing and having a seat at the table is an integral part of how our town government and community safety functions, where folks feel powerful and knowledgeable to step into leadership and co-design the town we all want to live in. We have this opportunity in front of us, and not only is it beneficial in regards to community safety and wellness, but to all other aspects of our town. I urge you to think of our entire community and how we could benefit from all of the CSWG's diversity, equity, and inclusion recommendations in addition to CRESS. Imagine thriving families who want to and are able to stay in Amherst and build community here. Think about resident retention and the revenue that could be created if our community feels truly supported and trusting of our government structures and the safety programs. Help us make Amherst diverse and welcoming and possible for all people to live, work, learn, and thrive. Let's dream here together. And then our last slide is the Amherst Towns, Town Council's affirmation. These are your words, not mine, so I'm not going to repeat them. I'm just going to emphasize that the same actions aren't going to give new results. So I really urge you guys to keep our recommendations in mind and make them reality. And thank you very much for the presentation. That was very helpful. Um, maybe what I would like to do is uh, have the opportunity to hear from other members of the working group who have their hands up as a next step and uh, let's see if there are any counselors who have questions or other members of the Finance Committee who have questions that they would like uh, to pose that, uh, are primarily directed to you or they might circle back to the town manager, whichever one. But first of all, um, I see that both uh, Deborah Frere and uh, Russ Vernon Jones have their hands up. So Deborah. Please unmute. Yeah. Hello. Thank you all for um, having us today. Um, I want to point out that obviously I was um, glad to hear that um, Mr. Bachelman was able to move a little bit further. Um, and I was happy to hear that a lot of the town councilors kind of expressed uh, a lot of support uh, for our uh, recommendations. Um, and like I said, and that Paul was able to increase it. But like um, Brianna and Alicia said, though, I, I did feel it was strange, though, that we weren't in the room, though, for the conversation. Um, because again, we are the ones with the information. So that felt strange. Um, but I wanted to kind of point that out that obviously, you know, I was glad to hear that. However, um, we're here though still, as Brianna and Alicia stated, to, 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 to make our full recommendations. So for me, I mean, I have so many things kind of flowing in my head, right? Because obviously I wasn't, I wasn't able to ask any questions. So <laughs> you're gonna have to bear with me because I have quite a few things to kind of talk about. One, again, is, is from what we heard on Monday, which is, you know, I, I don't know how to impress upon you all, right, that this is critical. 
right? That we you have uh, uh, members in the town of Amherst that do not feel safe. And most of these members are marginalized members, are BIPOC members. You need to make sure that they feel valued, that they feel respected, and they feel included. So remember on Monday, I, I told you all, right, that whenever my 17 year old, before he leaves the house, I am afraid for him. I am afraid for him. I have to basically remind him every time, be careful, drive carefully. I don't know if white parents in this town have to go through that process every single time. Not because I'm sure you have to go through that process because, hey, you know, things, in it, but not that a policeman is going to stop and possibly hurt him. So I'm a member of this, this community, and this is how I feel. And we have countless other members of this community that feel the same way. So let's start from that basis, right? So even though obviously I commend, you know, a Paul Bachman to, to having gone further, but it's still not far enough for me, because again, we have the full recommendations that we stated. So for instance, my questions, and I'll start with Chris, right? Is around, um, you know, it, you talked about calls directly to Crest. That's that's pivotal. There needs to be a, 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 an opportunity for people to contact Crest directly once this program starts, right? Because people do not trust contacting the police directly. So there has to be a separate uh, uh, ability for them to do that. So it, that was kind of like generalized, no specificity um, shown in terms of how to do that. So that needs to happen. And with that, there needs to be education money, needs to be marketing money, needs to be that sort of thing. So people know that that, might, that, that number even exists because mm. the population don't feel comfortable contacting the police when they're going through different things. So that has to be a part that we need to, to, to focus on. Um, again, yeah, stress that. I saw it in the, in the, in the presentation. But yeah, CSWG needs to be in part involved in the conversations with the creation of this program. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Because we've, you, we've seen throughout this process that you need our voice. Our voice is always out. Our voice is not included. And if our voice is not included, then these, these, these uh, um, issues are not gonna be brought to the table. So yes, we need to be at the table and we need to be part of the, uh, of the creation and the conversations. Period. The other thing is that the program needs to be 24 seven when, when it first starts out. So I don't know how, I don't know how the, the, the four, five people are gonna be able to do that. 16 hour, 16 hours, they're only gonna be 16 hours during the day. So what happens to the rest of the time? People are saying that they're afraid to call the police. So what's gonna happen for that other amount of time? So five, five people is not gonna cut it. So I want to hear what what's the possibility for more. Um, I was hearing a lot about you know FY 23, 24, 25. As as uh, Brianna and Alicia stated, for this first fiscal year, yes, we're not saying anything besides the reduction in already kind of like not hiring more police and and obviously the retirement, not hiring anyone into that that position and hopefully whatever monies is available. And I know you all were talking a lot about that, but whatever monies is available needs to go into the CREST program and, and all of our other recommendations, right? But FY23, FY24, FY25, why, you know, there they should be more reduction because uh, CREST is gonna be responding to those calls, right? So therefore there's gonna be less police. You're gonna have to be lessening police in those years. Therefore, there should be money to go into press program since we will be increasingly reducing police. So I didn't, I didn't hear a mention of that. Okay. The other thing too is around, um, you know, our other recommendations. Critical. You know, our town is not inclusive. Our town is not equitable. A, a, a diversity, equity, inclusion department is critical. And and I, I heard a count, you know, a few of the councilors bring that up, which I was very happy. I mean, I wasn't in the thing, but I was going like this in private, you know? Um, so it's like, we, you know, that, that needs to be critical because we're, we, you're not inclusive, we're not diverse as a town. And also when we're talking about the youth empowerment, we're talking about the BIPOC cultural center, which will be utilized by all families, not just BIPOC 
families. But when we're talking about that, it's because there's no space that feels safe for BIPOC families in the Amherst community, right? So when, when you're saying, well, why can't LSE, LSSE or other programs that are already established do that? Is because they, their space is not inclusive of, you know, of, of these other populations and these marginalized populations. So we need to kind of really, you know, focus and, and hear that. So I think, you know, sorry, I, I mean, like I said, I, you know, since I wasn't in there, I, I couldn't ask my questions as they arose, but there we go. That's me. Paul, could I hear some, is there some responses to some of my questions? Paul, go ahead. Sure, thanks, Ms. Ferra. Um, yeah, I think, you know, the, the call-in number I tried to, I, I don't know the technological answer for that. I think I tried to say that there is a, uh, I know the, the working crew had suggested a, a call-in number and that it actually, if we had one, it might increase the calls coming in. I, and that because there's, I think I had heard from your testimony and from others that there might be people who won't call 911, but they may call a different number. So I think that that is a technological solution that uh, we would talk with dispatch about where does that call land? Is it land in dispatch? Is there a separate person answering that phone, that, that type of thing? Um, I don't know the legal requirements under calls for emergency assistance. We'd wanna do some research on that. Um, again, I, I don't wanna call it to be, you know, if it's unanswered or whatever. I think you're absolutely right in publicizing the number. If we put a number out there, we have experience with that with the COVID hotline. Um, we, need, we would need to really uh, get that number out there as, as a special number that people could call in an emergency and get it through trusted networks um, for the people who are most likely to use it. Uh, the 24 hour coverage, I get that. I think, you know, this is a, you know, where I differ with where the working group is, is that I'm suggesting a pilot program that would begin and then assess what the need is and, and sort of get our, we need to crawl before we walk, uh, walk before we run. We need to sort of understand how this program, because it's not an off the shelf program, I don't think. I think we need to customize it for our community. So that's that's how I'm approaching it. Russell, Russ. Uh, I would like to speak, but I'd like you to give an opportunity to my colleagues of color to speak first, please. Okay. Um... Thank you for having me. And I want to start by really um, thanking the town manager for um, removing the Economic De Development Director Fund. So DEI, I was one of the people that really opposed that position because I felt that the position benefits BID and the chamber. Um, we've had um, economic de development directors in the past, and I don't see, you know, what they did in the past benefited uh, BIPOC community. I, so I was, however, um, I know that the town manager has, you know, moved the needle a little bit, but I'm still not satisfied um, with your proposal. Um, pilot program will set press program for a failure period. And I hear what the management team have, you know, have done. I appreciate your time. But there are some of us in CSWG group who have experience in program development. I have been in human services, social services, mental health field for more than 20 years. I did do a restaurant as a, you know, for a decade, but I am very familiar with this field. Um, for me to sit to tonight, acting like it will take 11 months to develop CREST program is just ridiculous. Um, CREST program is not a mental health um, treatment program. We, you know, we're not saying that we're going to be treating people that have behavioral health. We, you know, uh, that would be resources that we can refer people to. And then to spend a whole 11 months is just doesn't make sense to me. What I, what I observed, what I heard is make excuses. Bike what people don't, you know, they're not our priority. We will hear what you're saying, but we will do it later. It takes time. We want to make it work. We need to collect data. 
we need to do this. Excuse upon excuse upon excuse. I felt very disrespected that we spent so many months putting this together. And then, you know, the town manager, when you gather your management team, you didn't even, you weren't even including us anymore. And just to get your report, like a couple hours, several hours this today, before we come in here, you kind of threw us off um, because it's not what we expected. Um, I also want to speak uh, about um, the reference made regarding there are other resources in town, like the school family center. And not to be insulting or anything, I'm sure the school staff who, who um, work at the family center, they're doing their best, but it's a disaster. It's not working. It's, it's a white space. And who is the superintendent? It's a white man. Who is the um, special education director? It's a white woman. And so that's not our space. You know, uh, uh, BIPOC families don't access services from there. I don't, I think you all are out of touch of what we've been telling you guys. You don't get it. And we, we hear all the nice talking and everything, but we don't live our experiences. It's not going to work. We need our own space. We need uh, the BIPOC uh, cultural center. We need CRES where people can actually feel comfortable accessing services. If you're going to start, uh, start um, have only four um, responders, it's not going to 16 hours a day. And then at the end of one fiscal year, you say, oh, it didn't work out. Uh, it's not working. Let's move on. Let's go back to the old ways that it's not working. I have a lot to say, but I will stop. It's just, you know, if I say I'm frustrated tonight, it will be like understatement. I feel that you guys are not taking BIPOC community seriously at all. I want to really uh, shout out to uh, a part, uh, Councillor Pat D'Angelo. I and there are some other people that um, you guys have to do better. We pay taxes in this town. We're part of the, this community and we're not benefiting from, um, from all the resources. Thank you. Thank you, Tashina. Rowan, Carmen. Please unmute if Okay, sorry, my unmute button wasn't working. Um, so I'm just gonna turn my camera on. So I'm gonna say, first of all, that I'm extremely disappointed as are other people that are part of our group. Um, and I'm gonna call it for what it is. It was racist. It was a very racist act for you guys not to include us in the conversation. And what I have to say to that is shame on you, Amber. Shame on you because you guys try to present yourselves as if you're this diverse community. I'm gonna give you a quick example. The first time I ever went to Providence, I was um, in the car, you know, just hanging out, kids in the back and I looked up at a billboard and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna live here. And my husband at the time was like, why? And I said, because I just saw a billboard that had a doctor's office that had very many different people. But the one thing I noticed about it, it didn't have one white person on the billboard. It was made up of people of color. As a woman who is a doula, a student midwife in this community and who has lived here over 30 years, I have never had the option to have a birth worker be a person of color to support me in my births. That is what Amherst represents to me. To walk into a room and be the only. To have people that were on school committee back in the day because they felt like they knew my mom look me dead in my face and say to me, 
when I was pregnant with my second ch son, is that child gonna be the sibling of that child? To have the audacity to ask me that question. That is an experience that I have had in this community. That was someone who was a person in the government of this community, looking me in my face. First of all, they both came out of my stomach. So that's the first thing. Second of all, mind your business. Like the fact that I would have to even go there, I just looked at this person and was like, yes. And I walked away dumbfounded. To park in a spot with my handicap, my handicap flag, because I have rheumatoid arthritis, I am disabled, I have good days and bad days. And literally, and, and this, I, I will say this was not an Amherst, but this is, am, this, is, this is encompassing of the whole area. There is no place in the valley that I can go that I don't feel this way. And so I got, I literally got harassed to tears by someone because they didn't believe that I was disabled to tears, but here's the kicker. The person who was with me, who, was, who I thought was, who has had my back, literally made the situation about her. The, and she is a white woman. And this is, this, these are the things that we deal with in this community every day. I've lived here 30 years. I've gotten followed in CVS. I don't have a criminal record. I don't have, there's no reason for somebody to follow me in CBS, but they do. I remember my friends bragging about how they could go into CBS and nobody would follow them, but you know, they would bring a black person in with them because they knew they would follow the black person around and not them. These are things that happen in this community between the microaggressions, between the mega aggressions, between, you know, not even being asked to the table or having to sit on the sidelines while a white person interprets what my feelings are or what my situation is or what they think is best for me is absolutely unacceptable. Shame on all of you who sat by and allowed that to happen. And the thing is, is that when, when like at our last meeting, I literally was like, I would love to take each and every one of you and drop you in a community of color where you know nobody, you know nothing and tell you you need to survive. Because the thing is, is that you would feel really out of place and you would suddenly realize, wow, this must be just a smidgen of what it feels like. But see the thing that I was like, but then on the other hand, I know how our community works we're not gonna let anybody go hungry. My door's open, my door's open. Everybody knows that they can call me, they can come by my house, they can come see me at any time. I will feed them. It doesn't matter how little food I might have in my refrigerator. It doesn't matter what is going on. I will drop things to make sure that somebody else is safe. And that's how we do in our community because it's not about how much money we make. It's not, a how, it's not about what status we are in the community. It's about embracing everyone in our community. Amherst, you're failing. You've been failing. The moment that you guys decided to take away the, the, stu the kids um, center that was where uh, Bertucci's used to be, and it used to be an all glass building and all the students would go swing by there after school and y'all decided to sell that to Bertucci's, you fail. When you guys decided to bounce the Boys and Girls Club all over town to make it every year, we had no idea where it was, you failed. When you failed to hire and support Black teachers who are coming in to the point that they leave after two years, you're failing. You have failed the community of color in Amherst from the day it started, the day it was established. At any time you feel uncomfortable, it's pushback. It's what are we gonna do? How are we gonna do it? But you know what? I guarantee if I do a little research, I can find programs that were run and, and offered to the town by white community members. And you guys have funded it with very little question, very little pushback. And it is very disappointing and it's very disgusting that you guys will sit there 
and think that you're doing something positive. But at the same time, find funds for this, that, and the other white spaces. And you, 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 you know, I, I know that makes some of you uncomfortable, white spaces. What do you mean white spaces? I mean, I can't go into a store and, and guarantee that I'm going to see a black owner. And when they are here, they're here for such a short little period of time. You have to work on yourself and what you do. Holding a sign, putting, putting Black Lives Matter up on, up on your front lawn means nothing. It's performative. Do some actual work. And it shouldn't even be the BIPOC community that has to explain to you and tell you over and over and over again how to do it. The information is out there. It needs to hurt. It needs to feel uncomfortable. Because if you don't feel uncomfortable, you don't, you're not learning a lesson. You're not understanding what's going on. Because every day I walk through life feeling uncomfortable. And the last thing I'm gonna say is another story. My son is now 25. And when we had the forum for the CSWG, he, I, had to com I had to convince him to speak. He didn't wanna speak. And it broke my heart listening to him speak because he was in the newspaper quite often for sports. He was a well-known and well-respected young man in this community. And he was detained because he looked like somebody who did something on New Year's Eve as he's walking to his girlfriend's house. And the situation escalated to the point that another student who knew him from Amherst saw what was going on, was like, what's up? What are you doing? Like, there's no way that this person did this. They were ignored. And so they started going on Snapchat and Facebook and everything, reaching out to other students and being like, they're detaining Donovan. And from what I understand, there was like 25 kids out there talking to this officer and being like, look, you have the wrong person. 25 students. I question what would have happened if nobody had been there. I don't know. It scares me because everybody says it's not going to happen in Amherst, but I've been here 30 years. My mom was very well known in this community. I'm well known in this community and my son who also is well known in this community was detained. So no, I don't trust the community of Amherst very much. I don't trust non-BIPOC people very much. You have given me plenty of reasons not to trust you. You don't, you don't make it, you don't make any space for us. And you make that clear with every one of these meetings that happens that we've attended that you've attended of ours you've made it very clear we are not welcome and so if you don't want us to continue to feel that way and if you don't want us to continue to see you in that light then you need to make some real change not comfortable change real change thank you thank you Brianna do you have more? Um, Russ, my comments were just to the slideshow. I did get a chance to look at it on my lunch break. Did you want to comment first? I can. Okay. Um, well, I, I do want to appreciate the amount of work uh, that the town manager, uh, and I know that the town council and finance committee do uh, week in and week out. Uh, and I appreciate your attention to detail uh, and the specificity of your questions tonight and those of you who supported the CREST program and the DEI director. Um, you know, at the, in the early in his comments, the town manager talked about, we need to address the urgency for change. And I have to say that in your discussion tonight, I heard a concern for getting the right responder to each call. 
Uh, I heard a concern for relieving the police department of some calls that are really not their specialty, but I didn't really hear a sense of urgency about the fact that many, many BIPOC people in our community do not feel safe, will not call the police when they need safety services. That's a public safety problem. And there needs to be a sense of urgency about dealing with that. I do want to pick at two specific issues um, that I think need to be changed at a minimum uh, in the town manager's proposal. The first is that the budget slide shows whole, hiring the community responders for five months. Now, we've agreed that it's going to take two months to train them. That means they're only going to have three months left in the year to be uh, doing their job. They're not really gonna go operational until April 1st. So when we're developing the budget for next year, we're gonna have no idea how this program works. So the start to the program needs to at least be moved a few months ahead. And I believe, you know, I've looked carefully. I, I understand the, all the implementation questions. I've, you know, I've been an administrator. I've initiated new programs. I know what it takes. I don't think we should try to do it immediately, but we do need preparation time. Uh, but we can't wait until only five months are left in the, in the fiscal year, or we won't have the information we want, and we won't have responded to the uh, urgency for change. We won't have met the needs of our BIPOC community members. Secondly, I think when the town manager introduced his budget to you, with all due respect to Scott and Gabe and Ron, he did not tell you he was increasing the police department by two positions. But the truth of the matter is the police department has been functioning with 44 sworn officers for the whole second half of the fiscal year. And the budget he gave you and the budget that he still is holding to tonight has 46 officers. This is not the time to be increasing the level of police service. This is not the time to be adding positions especially when the, the goal is how do we shift positions to an alternative responder model. Doing, making that kind of shift is often really difficult because there's no way to do it without laying off people in the department you're reducing. You have a unique opportunity. There are four and probably five vacancies in the police department right now. You can make this shift this year without having to lay anybody off, without terminating any valued police officer. We need, more, we need more community responder positions and we need them for more time. The, the money is right, sitting right there in the police budget. Now, the other thing about that is it also makes the problem smaller for FY23. You create a bunch more police positions you're going to have, you know, again, you're going to not be able to find the money because the money's in the police department. So doing it now while there are vacancies is a real advantage. And finally, I know there's some concern about leaving the town short of service. Well, you know, the police chief has explained to us that he can't count on being able to hire somebody who's already been trained in the academy. And it takes eight to 12 months to train somebody if they have to go through the academy. I'm confident we can get crest server responders up and working uh, considerably faster than that. So if you want to relieve the police department, you want to make sure there's enough police coverage for police work, get crest up and running in a sizable enough uh, dimension uh, that we do relieve the police department of the things that are really not police work. Uh, and we begin to respond to, the, to the, the, the needs of the BIPOC community. I think the positions and the money are there. Uh, and I, I think it's a realistic thing to have a more substantial start uh, for FY22. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Um, so what I'm gonna do is uh, just see if Paul has anything that he wants to say in, uh, after what we've, uh, just heard and uh, was to offer the finance committee. Then I'm gonna quickly explain how the finance committee has to proceed under the charter. And I think that will conclude the evening.
Excuse me, but Ms. Owen has not spoken yet, and she wants to speak. And I don't know if Tashina Bowman uh, wants to speak again. Her hand is. No, I, think, uh, I was assuming that uh, um, hands get usually lowered uh, in meetings by Athena. I was keeping track. Hi, Andy. I would actually, I still do have a lot of questions for Mr. Mr. Bockelman on the presentation that he showed you all. Okay. So, I mean, because I wasn't able to join the initial discussion, I would like to ask them now if possible. Paul, do you want to go ahead and have the questions first? Yeah, of course. So I guess my first question looking at that slideshow is, is the community safety working group staying together past September? Because I noticed in the planning that the bulk of the work is going to start in October. I think again, it is critical that the CSWG be a part of the planning process and implementing whatever needs to be implemented as this program starts. So um, if I can, Andy, uh, so we, I'm eager to look at your next proposal in part B of the proposal, which includes the development of a resident oversight committee of some sort. And so I want to see if that's in competition with what the CSWG is doing, or if that's a separate organization, separate group, uh, and has a different separate mission. I think that CSWG's charge will will be expired when you um, uh, deliver your next report. I did put in the presentation. I would invite members. Of, you know, I didn't want to presume that anybody would be able, would be willing or interested in participating. But I would invite members of the CSWG to work in the development of the program. Okay. And my next question, um, there was a slide rep, um, on the BIPOC Cultural Center, and it said that this center needs to be evaluated by the DEI director. I was just wondering what you meant when you said evaluated, because I think one of the habitual problems that this town has is forums and surveys for BIPOC people to come forward and talk about issues they're experiencing in the community and nothing happening. And so many have happened in this last year. I'm just wondering what else needs to be evaluated for us to have a BIPOC cultural center. Um, if I can, Andy, as, um, yeah, I don't really know the answer to that question. I, I know that that's a, a major ask or a request under from the working group. Um, I am not prepared to sort of evaluate that and, and figure out how to fund something like that. You put together a budget on what it would take to operate it. Um, so I just felt like it needed more time, and I did, there was just no time during this front this 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 budget making process to address that. Okay, I would have felt just a little bit more comfortable if it said that rather than being evaluated by the DEI okay. director. I understand that. Yeah. Um, and then I'm wondering about the Harvard School program that you talked about. I'm wondering why we're not utilizing the CAHOOTS consulting that's available. You've referenced it in our charge and they're a program that's been around for over 30 years now and they've learned a lot and they provide consulting for different towns. So I'm wondering why we're sort of a case trial for the Kennedy School, but we're not reaching out to CAHOOTS. So, but, and that would that would certainly be an option, but the CAHOOTS is a different model. It's the model that isn't being recommended by the working group. The working group is looking at an employee-based model. CAHOOTS is a contract model. And so I think if we want to move in the contract um, realm instead of hiring employees, but we want to contract with a social service agency like Whitebird, then we would it would make sense for us to consult with CAHOOTS. Okay. And then my last question was, what markers are you going to use if you've developed them yet um, to assess the effectiveness of CRESS? I'm really worried that because you're not fully funding it, it's not going to be as effective as the group is anticipating. No, that's a, it's a great point because I, I don't think CRESS can be evaluated totally in year one. It's just, I think um, Russ and you, several members have said it's not gonna be enough time to really even get the word out that you can call independent a d independent number. I don't know what the what the uh, markers would be. I think that's something that people would have to look into. I think I think it's important to create a baseline data, which which has already sort of been done uh, on a certain level, but also so we can. I don't know what the markers are. What what is what do how do we measure whether people feel safe in their community? It might be you know how many calls were actually ha handled. Uh, it might be a call based assessment. So I just I don't have an opinion on that. And I think it I would leave it to the group to try and develop that. Okay. And I would just ask going forward that when these implementation meetings are happening with the chief of police and other members of safety services that exist in Amherst, that CSWG members be present because we have been studying this and we should be part of the conversation. Yes, I think in, in my proposal, I, I was going to invite uh, members from the CSWG to be at the table for these discussions. Thank you. 
Andy, I'm wondering if we would be able to bring Dr. Shabazz into the um, Actually, Zoom. Actually, uh, thank oh. you for mentioning that because I uh, realized she been, that one she, of the agenda. Well, she was the she was the lead, the um she represents the consultant group that we worked with who helped us create the budget. That's why I bring that up. Yeah, I, I wanted to actually uh, say that uh, we actually have public comment on the agenda and it's required as a part of uh, all regular meetings of the council and uh, uh, committees. So I did want to. Uh, so anybody who is in the audience who would like to speak. Uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Shabazz has her hand up already, and I will call on her first, um, as you suggested, uh, but other people. And uh, I want to, uh, because it is getting uh, late now, we need to, to, to move this along. Please raise your hand so I have an idea of the number of people. And I ask you to, to limit your time. Athena. Uh, We'll run the clock though uh, for uh, Dr. Shabazz because she was a, one of the consultants. Um, I'm not going to um, do the same thing. And I think that for other people, I'm going to have to ask that we limit it to two minutes, but I'm not limiting Dr. Shabazz. Uh, so please bring her in the room first. Hello. You all can hear me? Yeah, hi. Okay. Yeah, hi. I can hear you. Yes, yeah, so so thank you, Andy, and uh, thank you, town manager, for reconsidering the budget. Um, it still needs work, as the CSWG have, of course, um, you know, uh, outlined. Um, I'd like to speak to two things uh, because I think that the CSWG has done an excellent job of um, engaging with you uh, in terms of a, a real critique of what has been presented tonight. Um, first is to speak to the DEI director uh, position and uh, implementation of the CREST program redesigned by the town manager as LEAP. First off, uh, the research that the CSWG is pulling from and that um, some of the research, of course we did extensive research, but um, and the seven gen uh, MC group, we looked at um, the 2020 Center for American Progress report. Uh, hopefully you all have looked at that. It's the community responder model report uh, subtitled how cities can send the right responder to every 911 call. They uh, look at LEAP and they look at the CAHOOTS program. Um, I would really recommend that this finance committee and the town council uh, and the town manager look at that report for some comparative um, uh, issues and points that could be helpful as you, again, assess whether LEAP is the appropriate program for Amherst, or is it cahoots, or is it a customized uh, type of program that it, it sounds like that's where your heart is looking at something more customized. But um, so I just recommend that. Also, I'm going to agree with uh, Lisa Brewer and Pat DeAngelis here about the issues regarding the DEI director position. It is an absolutely vital part of the CSWG recommendation and is desperately needed for this community. It is not an abstract, good feeling type of position. It is a position that uh, needs to be funded by a professional DEI director, someone who is trained and has a background and education to fill that position right away, to be able to plan, assess, and implement goals outlined not only by the town manager, but the work of the CSWG. It's, it's really disrespectful to just say we're going to elevate a position whereby someone is a clerk or a position that, uh, you know, is in the town hall already. This is a, needs to be a newly created position. There are towns in the state of Massachusetts that are around our size that have dedicated DEI directors. 
and it deserves to have someone with a master's at least, at the very least, or a doctorate to, um, to provide these needed skills and knowledges and step into this position. And that a DEI director is someone that attends on all levels of community development, including the economy. So diverse people bring in these types of necessary skills. And what happens here is that racially, and I'm saying here in Amherst, racially, linguistically, and ethnically diverse persons arrive here for a short time, often for education, educational advancement, but choose not to stay because of the discomfort and sometimes hostile economic, cultural, and social climate. That is a fact. I just had a conversation with someone that graduated from UMass recently, and they are already looking to leave. To this end, I noticed the description of equity and diversity on the town website as of this week has expanded in the last week into two paragraphs. And if I search the town website as a potential visitor or someone moving into Amherst, I would still find the statement and the work on diversity anemic that's, that is uh, shown on the town website. Um, it's assumed that a diversity, equity, inclu inclusion director would not attend to or consider economic investment and innovation. This is untrue. The short-sightedness is a continual problem on the part of the town and the town council. Having all kinds of people will help us make better decisions. More diverse employers can bring people from all over the world to work and build in Amherst. When people move here, they must find an environment that not only welcomes everyone, but educated and skilled people need to feel that they are empowered in the places where they pay taxes and invest. A role of chief diversity inclusion officer or director would advise the town on issues to provide resources for the school department, business, staff programs, activities to promote inclusive excellence and welcoming environments for all. They would have a lead role in facilitating the development of strategies, strategies people, a plan, policies and guidelines that advance understanding of diversity inclusion across hiring, business development, the workforce, the community in total. This would also mean a, per a person that coordinates with individuals who are overseeing diversity inclusion efforts within individual divisions within the town, the boards, right, and commissions and develop new programs that encourage active engagement and activities that demonstrate the city's commitment to inclusion. This is not a part-time position and should not be given short shrift. A more diverse workforce and community is a more economically robust community, period. The last thing I want to speak to is that, you know, when we look at budgeting, one of the things to keep in mind, particularly with the CAHOOTS program as a model, uh, our research found that uh, Eugene, Oregon saved an estimated 8.5 million per year in public safety costs by reducing, reducing the need for police response. And the savings accrued and a town like Amherst would be able to reinvest those funds back into the responders program to expand its reach and promote it in a sustainable way. So again, the Center for American Progress report uh, also has this information. Lastly, Amherst is gonna need to tailor the program that the town manager, the CSWG has uh, created. And it points to uh, fit like for a local context and it must effectively meet the needs of the residents. We've said that, but what that means is that the town should meaningfully involve the community. That's the CSWG. Other oversight groups, as far as a review group, et cetera, fine, but the CSWG needs to remain to engage residents in every step of the process, as we will be back to square one, where the people and the groups who are disenfranchised will most likely have to come into contact with police, or in this case, community responders um, that do not necessarily fit what the CSWG had in mind. Okay, so the CSWG will be your best representatives of the larger community, especially regarding BIPOC members and should be maintained as a part of the process and an ongoing part of the town government to elicit feedback if you want to think of it as that way. Who are our people that can provide this, this liaison relationship? 
with the community and with the program, okay? So I think we have to remember who are the stakeholders. Uh, the CSWG has brought the information of folks most vulnerable and who would most benefit. And why on earth would you exclude them from shaping this process unless you want to repeat the same mistakes? That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. Um, so, uh, Paul, I will leave it to you to raise your hand at any point or to signal to me because I'm looking right now at the attendee list and uh, I said uh, we need to do public comment, uh, except public Walker comment. Hand please, up for quite a while. Please, please li limit to two minutes uh, for public comment. Uh, Ms. I'm not sure if you heard her comment, but Ms. Walker has hand, had her hand up for quite a while. So I just want to acknowledge that her hand has been raised. And I also have my hand up. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I need to draw the meeting to a close at some point. So I just have to be very careful about making sure we get the public comment and that's why I was trying to move over to allow the public in for a few minutes. Um, I'm okay with continuing public comment. But, but go ahead, go ahead uh, Ms. Walker. No, I'm okay with continuing public comment but I would just like to speak because I did have questions and I have had my hand raised since before we started public comment. Um, and so I do have questions for the town manager in regards to his presentation but I can wait until after public comment. Okay. No. Um, so, and I see that Ms. Ferrari has to, um, and again, I'll conclude with comment, uh, just a reminder about what the role of the finance committee and the council is under the charter, but I'll do that at the end. Uh, going to public comment, the first is a, and I'm not going to, uh, Ms. Kara Kashian, I believe, is the last name. And uh, I'm not going to try to let you introduce yourself so I don't mispronounce your, your name entirely. Uh, Hi there. Um, my name is Noah Lani. Um, I would like to start off by saying one of the issues that I had in Amherst is that folks never actually tried to pronounce my name correctly. So that feels pretty offensive that you just said you're not going to try. Um, I would also like to point out that as an outside member, I don't live in Amherst anymore. So I wanna make that very clear. Um, I just sat waiting to speak for two and a half hours because this matters to me as a person who doesn't live there anymore. I feel like what was made very clear by, I believe y'all are the council now, um, is that y'all are not invested in actually making change in Amherst because y'all didn't invite the people who proposed the budget, who built the programs, who are making these recommendations to speak, to present what they have been working on for months. And that's incredibly disrespectful and Tashina named it and racist. So I feel like what y'all are showing is that you're not actually committed to making any change. And if that is not the case, if you are actually interested and creating a community where your BIPOC members feel safe, then the first thing you need to do is invite them to, 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 invite them to sit at the table. And it is wildly inappropriate as, it is wildly inappropriate that watching this meeting, I see, I don't see any diversity. Like the first step should have been inviting people of color to join the council period. Cause y'all are speaking on stuff that you don't live, that you don't know. And then are interpreting it for outsiders, for, for members of the community, for people who are like listening to this in a way that is made very clear by this group that is inaccurate. You're like inaccurately reciting the work that they have done and not including them to clarify and answer questions and even like ask questions about the information that you're interpreting. And I'm really disappointed to have sat here and like realize that nothing has changed since I left, since I moved away. And so I would really like y'all to sit with that. And I expect y'all to just do better because if that's what you want, then you actually need to take the strides forward. And 
I don't know if the time is up, but the last thing I want to say that I uh, felt very hurt by is that y'all are talking about having a budget to increase the police when that is literally the exact opposite. Like I expect to see that decrease when this group is providing alternatives to the police. The expectation is that the problems that they can't solve, which they should be trained on irregardless, they should be able to step into a situation and say, this is out of our realm, let's hand it off to the appropriate person, which it sounds like they're not. Those positions need to be decreased so the money is going to the appropriate places. And yeah, that's all I have to say. I commend I commend all of you on this committee for putting this together and being patient while you're being wildly disrespected. Like kudos to y'all, like kudos. And I wanna make it very clear that I don't, I don't even live in Massachusetts anymore. And I found it important to hop on this call to defend folks who aren't being defended by the people who are claiming they support BIPOC folks in this community. Thank you. and. Uh... I was very interested in your comment and I uh, appreciated your comment at the beginning because I don't know if it's more disrespectful to attempt a name and get it wrong or to not attempt the name at all. And uh, so thank you for that comment. Uh, somebody who is signed in as Canopy Equity, uh, please state your name where you live because uh, I don't uh, know what that is, but I see your hand up. Hi, my name is Amara Donovan, um, and I grew up in Amherst for 28 years um, and also attended the University of Massachusetts Amherst with a dual degree in sociology and public health with a focus on racial equity. And I now work in anti-racism and racial justice, both in a community engagement nonprofit and in anti-racism consulting. Um, and I urge the town council and finance committee to adopt all of the recommendations formed by the CSWG after countless hours of community engagement, synthesis, and meaningful discussion about our community. The CREST program is a huge and impactful part of this that will revolutionize the experiences of BIPOC and other historically marginalized groups in our community. The foundation of a thriving community is trust and safety. The CREST program provides a foundation for that and begins the work of restoration with a community that has experienced immense harm at the hands of policing in Amherst specifically. I was incredibly distraught to see the clear lack of respect and investment in the CSWG made clear throughout their entire work from being publicly chastised by a town council member, lied to about funding, asked not to attend essential meetings such as the safety portion of the budget meeting, barred from presenting the information they deem important as BIPOC community members themselves, and now being met with barriers to making the fruits of their labor come to fruition. This is racism. If Amherst truly wants to be a diverse and inclusive community rooted in equity and anti-racism, this must be reflected in the dollars we choose to invest and the holistic view of programs, services, and resources we invest in. Anti-racism cannot be an add-on. It must be integrated throughout the town, safety services, mental health services, and governance across the board. This is a start, but this is not enough. I urge you to defund the police and invest in the BIPOC community immediately and with urgency. Additionally, I would just like to say that the members of the CSWG are community safety and wellness. Your constant questioning of their data and asking the town to collect even more information before investment is a racist white supremacist strategy. No one asks white people to go gather more data and information and to prove themselves after years of this data being available to the town. This data is right in front of your faces, and it is so disrespectful for you to say that it's not enough. BIPOC residents are not ob obligated to tie their data in a bow of your white supremacist perfectionist standards. Stories are data. Your response is not enough. Again, the members of the CSWG are community safety and wellness. My doula who made sure my son was born safe and healthy is on this committee. My advocate in education and in all of my life across the board as a resource is on this committee. The woman and business owner who, who served me and my friends food after school from her business is on this committee. That is community safety and wellness. Y'all really need to pull out your notebooks and start taking notes. Pull out the tablet, pull out whatever privileged device you have and take notes and be active participants in this work. It is your job and how you are elected and we will vote you out. The CSWG, you all are incredible. Continue to stand in your power and continue to take up space because you and our community deserve this and you should not allow this meeting to be cut short. 
I have seen this town council stay on meetings because of buildings and because of mosquito spraying longer than you are willing to hear BIPOC community members out. And I think that you are fearful and I think that it is cowardly of you. Thank you. Thank you, Allegra. Hi, my name is Allegra Clark. I live in Amherst in District 2. Um, I am disgusted, but not surprised that the Community Safety Working Group was not included in presenting the plan for press. Um, and, you know, I think we need to do better as a town. We've asked countless times for BIPOC people to share their stories and we're not listening to them. And this was just another example throughout this process of how we haven't listened or haven't even given the space to be heard. Um, I, I know I've said this before, but I think if there are vacancies in the police department right now, those need to be transitioned. Those positions need to transition over to the CREST program. And every time a vacancy is coming up in the next few years, that should be transitioned over to the CREST program. If, if we are going to follow the recommendation to reduce the number of policing and to increase the services provided by CREST and look at the kinds of calls that they are responding to, that's how we need to do it. Um, I do wanna just share some research and some data since it does seem that sometimes that does get through. Um, recently, I was on a webinar by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine and a doctor, Rhea Boyd out of the Children's Hospital in Oakland shared her research on policing and its impacts. She said that the harms associated with police exposure to black and brown children begin in utero with mothers who live in neighborhoods with high level of police presence having a higher risk of preterm birth. Additionally, there are educational outcomes of black and Latino students who live in close proximity to police killings, police surveillance of their neighborhood and violence by the police in general. This exposure increases absenteeism, decreases GPA and decreases the likelihood of graduation. Her recommendations include reducing children's exposure to police and police violence, including using non-police responders for 911 calls, shrinking the police footprint and diverting resources into healthcare infrastructure. So I think that also shows that not only is CRESS important, but the other recommendations of having a youth empowerment center and a BIPOC cultural center are also important to create community safety. Thank you, Zoe. Hello, uh, my name is Zoe Crabtree and I live in District 5. Um, I had a couple of questions that came up during Dr. Professor, sorry, it's been a long day, Town Manager Bockelman's uh, presentation earlier today. Um, and one of them, uh, or several of them have already been pointed out. Um, the first is that I noticed on the um, slides that the CSWG is not mentioned at all after the, um, in the, the month by month plan, it's not mentioned at all after the August row, um, which was very concerning to me because I know that uh, one of the things that they have specifically requested is that they, are that they will be continued so that they can continue helping implement this program. Um, so I hear, Professor, uh, Town Manager Bachman, that you have said that you've invited people and you don't expect that, you don't want to expect that they will necessarily stay on. Um, but it was very concerning to me to see that they weren't even mentioned after August um, because they really specifically have been requested for them to continue. Um, secondly, um, as uh, Russ Vernon Jones pointed out, uh, at this point in the plan um, that Bachman put forward, uh, it seems like Crest will only be really active for a couple of months before budget decisions will be made. And I know that right now it sounds like you're like, you know, making promises about how we're going to continue funding it. Even we'll figure out what the benchmarks are and we'll figure, you know, we won't be judging it too harshly. But I really don't trust that when push comes to shove next year 
and you're making hard budget decisions, that you will look at something that you haven't really given a chance to succeed and have quality data to, that you, because you care so much about all this data that we've been giving you for over a year and you're still barely listening, um, that you will look at this thing that hasn't gotten the chance to have the full level of data that you think is required. Uh, and it's hard for me to imagine that you will then double the budget because it will need to be around for a whole year instead of half a year, um, let alone increase the number of staff beyond what you've currently allocated for. It's very concerning to me. Um, and thirdly, um, as other people have pointed out as well, um, there's no mention of any additional police officer positions being frozen. There's the two that were frozen by the town council last year, which there's been no uh, discussion about necessarily whether they will continue to be frozen because the $130,000 that has, was originally promised was from what wasn't spent last year. Uh, so that is still, I think, an unanswered question for me. And as people have mentioned, there are additional police positions that are open beyond that, which sounds like maybe four or five. Uh, it's a lot of money and it should be going to Cress. There's no reason that we should be continuing to increase the police budget, which is currently increasing this year by a couple percent. Um, although maybe slightly not now that you've taken out the extra money you didn't even know was in the educational budget for the police. Um, in any case, it should not be increasing uh, when you are intentionally shifting away from police department towards a community responder model, which is specifically what you requested that the CSWG do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I need to keep going because it's getting like Meg. Did you say Meg? Yes, I did, and you're there. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm uh, sort of paralyzed by the uh, important comments that have been made. I appreciate uh, Tashina's remarks. Hi, Tash. And I appreciated Paul's remarks. Um, I really, I had another set of comments I was going to make in support of the uh, Community Safety Working Group, which I still have great support for. I just urge everyone to be gentle and to try to find some level of trust that everybody's doing their best. Um, as a white person, I've learned that my experiences in Amherst are not the same experiences that people of color have, have had. It's a fact, it's just a plain fact that if you're a white person, you haven't had the same experiences living in this town. And we need those of us who are white need to accept that and understand it and explore what we can do to change that. And um, I'm really sort of, uh, I'm not gonna say too much because I had, a, I was gonna say a whole lot more but I'm really uh, been uh, totally uh, drawn in by this conversation and just urge every, all of us to be patient and to be listening and to try to care about each other as human beings and not um, be defensive. As white people, our experiences have been profoundly different and uh, it's just a fact. And so we need to support um, the recommendations of the Community Safety Working Group. And at the same time, we need to make sure that they'll work in the context of the town government and uh, I really appreciated Paul's remarks because he seemed to be put, putting forward a way that this could move, that we could implement much of what the working group is recommending. But I really urge people, if you have this little gut feeling of reaction, like Ugh, white people, like, ooh, what do they mean? They don't understand, you know, this is a little gut reaction that some white people can have when they hear people of color talking about their experiences. Don't go there. Just when those ex when white people have those experience those feelings of resentment and just let it go let it go that wasn't Thank what you. i was planning to say huh? <laughs> oh well but i'm oh, totally in support it. of the community support oops i got my earbuds i'm in support of the recommendations and i'm i'm delighted to hear about this leap program because this is a real, I'll say one more thing that I was going to say. This is a real opportunity for Amherst to 
move forward. And I appreciate that uh, Paul's been linked in with this group. Don't think of it as Harvard, think of it as a network of other communities around the country that are trying to do the same work. That the, it's not Harvard, it's a network of communities and um, we have, we can learn from other communities. Thank you. Thank you. And Yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm going to make two comments here. One is on behalf of the Human Rights Commission, the other is on behalf of myself. So I want to say that the Human Rights Commission is in full support of the Community Safety Working Group's recommendations and that we advocate for these recommendations to be fully funded. Personally, as a resident, I'd like to commend the CSWG members for their hard work. But I'd also like to honor the Black, Indigenous, and people of color on the working group for the courage that it takes to speak truth to power as a BIPOC person in the town of Amherst. It's a lot easier to get placated than it is to be heard. So you have my respect, my support, and I honor you. Thank you. Thank you. Marcy? Hello, uh, I'm Marcy Scott. And uh, I, like Meg, um, have been feeling very moved by this process. Um, I want to just say that in the beginning of the, the meeting and Paul's presentation, I was very excited at how enthusiastic Paul was and how he had worked really hard to bring money to the table to, to have it work. And then when the community safety group folks entered the room, I was quite surprised at how frustrated they were. And I realized, my gosh, two hours went by and here they were waiting, not, not being part of this and not having that opportunity to just look at the screen, for me to look at the screen and not see their faces in hindsight was really, really intense. So I appreciate them coming in and sharing that emotion and that experience that they had. And it really taught me something. As a white person, I am always learning. I'm always learning the ways that my intentions are good, but I don't always you know, do the right thing and I can fall short very easily in terms of, um, just the simple act of having everybody at the table. That, that makes perfect sense to me now, but I didn't think of it in the beginning when the presentation was happening. Um, to get back to the content, I really applaud what Lynn said and the enthusiasm with which Lynn's talked about the grant writing and the potentiality of helping to support um, some of these efforts with grants. And uh, I know that the Community Safety Working Group has done a lot of research about grants and that they had some stuff to offer on that, on that front. And I'm really, I was happy to hear Lynn talk about that. I also, I don't know who spoke of it, but there was some question about cross training and trying to save money by having it be both police and CRESS. And I just, at that moment, actually I was aware that there was nobody from the community safety working group to speak to that because I know that is absolutely antithesis to what they have been saying is so important that it be separated from the police and that the people in town who are BIPOC people do not trust the, the police as, um, as their safety network, as their safety resource. Um, and finally, I agree with Meg, you know, we, we have so much to learn and culturally, I think white people often don't like being yelled at and get, <laughs> get that uchy feeling that Meg discussed in, in the belly of like, whoa, I'm, I'm being attacked here. But we all, we all need to learn some stuff and um, hearing people share such raw emotion brings to me a very big feeling of respect for them and, um, and a lot of appreciation. And the Community Safety Working Group, the, the meetings that I have 
uh, had the honor to attend and to look at after the fact. I just really have, again, talking about process, really appreciated their process, their professionalism, their own, the combination of their smarts and their ability to research and find things out and also their humanness and their, their humanity and their sharing of, of their experiences. So I'll close now, but I really um, am grateful to have a chance to say something and I fully support the Community Safety Working Group. Thank you. Uh, two more kind of public comments and I'll turn back to the uh, working group for a few minutes. And then... Hello, this is Nadine, I'm uh, District 4. I'm just, uh, I just wanted to come on first to just say that the CSWG group, um, the work that they've been doing, I wanna commend them also to say, I appreciate their hard work. Um, I have been a resident of Amherst for over 27 years. And I wanna say, I'm just gonna come from a legal perspective to simply state that as we had seen in this past year, <clears throat> one of the things that I think that when we're looking at budgeting and we're looking for future is that it will cost more if we find our, the town of Amherst finds itself in a predicament like Minneapolis did or even um, <clears throat> or even Louisville, Kentucky, what happened with Breonna Taylor. When we start paying out legal fees, when we start paying out money, it's cheaper in the long run to invest in a community service group that will help eliminate or lessen the chances of there be some sort of police brutality and in addition for someone to be dead and no respect for someone's life. So I would say to the, as I know we're looking right now at the budgets and the numbers, but we also have to be looking at as a cost benefit analysis. And if there is a community service um, program available, as you know, that there's an insurance that you pay for that cost. And then it's lessened because you have this and you show that this is the work that you're doing. So that helps with the lessen of the cost. And if there's some sort of payout in the future, we at least are prepared and we show that we are make, we're being proactive instead of reactive, which is what all these other jurisdictions have been. And so um, that I would say that in order to provide some sort of extra comfort level, because uh, there has to be a level of trust for the BIPOC community and a place for them to feel very open, that they're heard and that there's possibility for them. I also have a uh, now a young adult raised a young child um, um, in Amherst and I had to have the same talks that Ms. Ferrer had to have every time he drove or every time he went out, even he went out with his friends. And, so, and still to this day, I still have that conversation with him while he's at school in Chicago. And so just wanting to say that it is important and that um, we want as residents in Amherst to be heard and to have a voice and for us to have seats at tables. So thank you. Nadine, thank you for your comments. Andy evidently lost connection and let me know that. Uh, Ash Hartwell, please enter the room. Thank you. Um, this will be brief, but I just wanted to, again, say that uh, how impressive the research and the thoughtfulness and the work that the Community Safety Working Group has put together and that <laughs> really to commend that and to recognize I feel that we should have a certain level of optimism that things are at a cusp and could change, but we have to do it together. We have to do it together. By that, I mean the white folk and the BIPAC folk working together. And the, although I really respect all the work that Paul put into that, I think that what is clear, unless there is integration and involvement of the dialogue um, with the with the groups, it, it it no matter how technically good it may be, it's not good because those voices aren't there, and and that's the message of tonight. If any message comes through really clearly, and I would argue that what our goal must be is to establish the trust and the consensus about the way to move forward. That's tough. It's going to take you know, work on both sides, but it has to happen if we're going to 
move forward and really make a structural change in this town. And we could do it. Everybody here is, is smart and able, but let's recognize it has to be done together or it's not gonna happen. So that's really what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ash. Uh, Meg, did you still have your hand up again? Or did, are you taking your hand? No, I forgot to put it down. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Meg, I'm back. Uh, okay, Andy, go ahead. Uh, I'm back, yeah. Uh, I think we were just going to, uh, Alicia asked, I believe, uh, to speak after public comment and ask questions, Paul. And I see one other hand up. And then wanted to uh, see um, to how we to draw this to a close. Um, I did have one comment um, to make, and I'm, it's not the, it's not meant to say that um, um, the comments we heard from the public weren't very important and that we weren't listening to them, but um, we had heard a substantial presentation at the council meeting. And uh, the um, goal was today to then um, hear from the town manager and to react to, to that because we had, uh, and uh, that may have been um, poorly thought out, but that was the intention. Um, Alicia, Brianna, uh, do either one of you want to um, ask questions? Uh, Andy, there's one more person yeah. in the public. Vera Cage is waiting to speak in public comment. Let's see. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Vera, why don't you um, conclude? You would. Uh, Please come in. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes, you can. Okay. Um, I speak in total support of the CSWG's um, proposal. The town needs to fund it 100%. I want to read a portion of your resolution in the aftermath of the death of Mr. George Floyd last year. You said, whereas as public officials, it is our duty to use our legal and moral authority to protect all members of our community, no matter their race or color or where they fall in the power spectrum. It is our duty to foster a community free of fear, intimidation, and violence, a community in which people are not targeted or hurt unnecessarily by law enforcement and provide equal protection under the law. You speak in this resolution about listening and putting groups together. And the CSWG is a group that is very much people of color centric and women centric. And for anyone to vote against funding this 100%, you are not true to the letter of your, to, to, the, to the language of your letter. What we need to hear from public officials who have the power is that you've not wasted people's time. My son is in the CSWG group. And what lesson is he gonna learn about participating in community engagement when his elders are sitting at the table, carving out a space for him to belong, to participate, to use his experiences as a black, a brown child growing up in this community, all the, the, the this is all the community that he knows growing up. What lesson are you imparting upon him about white supremacy and who holds power in this community? Dare not, dare not exclude the CSWG's work. Do not disrespect it. Please vote accordingly that you listen and you respect people's voices that have volunteered their time here. Thank you. Thank you. So then going back to uh, Alicia or Brianna as co-chairs of the committee, do you have questions that you um, 
we're proposing to post Paul and then. Uh, I also have my hand up. I've been having my hand up for a while. Yeah, yeah I know, but I was, um, I, I did see it. Um, and again, uh, I think we've, uh, getting to the point of exceeding our time, I see more hands going up and it's getting to be problematic. I did, did see your hand up before, but I wanted to go to the co-chairs. Um, I want to defer my comment to Ms. Ferreira and Ms. Walker, who have had their hands up for a while now. Um, thank you, Ms. Owen. So I just wanted to, um, I have a couple of comments and questions on Mr. Bachman's presentation. I am thankful that he went back and did um, reassess his budget um, allocation to us. However, it is still very insufficient. Um, and so there are a couple of things that are really concerning to me when seeing this. Um, the first thing is the implementation team. Um, and so I am just very confused as to, we actually set out parameters for an implementation team and who we wanted to be involved in the design process. Um, and they're not on here. And it says the CSWG members will be a part of the implementation process. However, it was also very clear to me at the beginning of this meeting that there have been multiple conversations in regards to our recommendations that we have not been a part of. Um, and sort of the entire coming up with this presentation was, it seemed like there was discussion amongst the implementation team and none of us were part of that conversation, but none of us were also even aware that that conversation was happening. And so that's very concerning to me, considering that Mr. Balkelman sits in all of our meetings and we could have been made aware that this was happening. And I'm sure that if we were made aware, we would have, um, we would have expressed our desire to continue to be involved and for our voices to be heard as a part of that process. So that's very concerning to me. Um, the implementation team itself. And then also a lot of these slides and a lot of the questions that are open or left to left that Mr. Bachelman has stated in these slides he doesn't have the answers to are things that we have already researched. And so I'm just also a little bit slightly confused as to there was a lot of question as to the money that we spent on our consulting team. Well, a lot of money has been put into the research and it is there and it is available. And uh, if certain things needed to be configured in order for the um, youth center to be implemented, implemented or for the, um, the, the multicultural family center to be implemented, then those things could have been brought up during our meetings because it has been a long part of the discussion that these were things that we were going to recommend. And I feel like what it would really look like for this to be a collaborative, inclusive process would be since the town manager was sitting in all of our meetings for him to say, hey, for us to be able to make this happen, this is the information we're going to need. And we have asked him also many times for that information to be given to us and we weren't received that feedback. So it's a little bit weird that, you know, there needs to be more, more research put into how we can make the youth center or the family center effective, but we've, we've done that research. That's what we've been doing for the past six months is the research. So it feels to me like we're being, we're being asked for more time, but I'm not understanding why, like, is the research just going to be done over again? and by who, and where is that money gonna come from since we've already spent the money on it. And the question here is money and, and the lack there of funding. Um, and then I also see that 80K was put aside to address anti-racism. That's the same 80K that was put aside this year that we utilized in order to complete our charge. And I just wanna say that that was not enough. We ran out of money. So we have a second half of our charge and we already don't have any money left. So I'm just not understanding how that 80K is going to be used successfully to address any anti-racism. And it was also put that, that possibly that 80K could be used for the stipends for the, um, the oversight board, but, um, and that possibly it could be used to help um, come up with more information to implement these other programs. But how is that going to happen when that wasn't even enough money for us to do the research? I'm not understanding. Um, it's, this is just not gonna work out. And then my final point was that when we came up with the alternative for community safety, all of our recommendations are equally as important. So Crest would be the, the um, responding to crime you know, like responding to the calls to the police, but we need preventative services in order to really lessen 
the, the, the calls that go to the police. We need the youth to be able to be engaged. We need them to have other activities to participate in. We need to really foster their development and their growth because there aren't a lot of opportunities available in this town to the youth period. Any youth, it is not avail available here. And so what is it, what is, what can they do? We heard at one of our family, at one of our forums, one of the positive experiences that were shared with the police was that there was a mother having um, difficulties with her child and they, she was able to call the police and the police responded. They were able to get her child back into the home and things were, were settled. And to me, although that illustrates a, a positive police experience, what it really illustrates is the lack of resources available to families in this community. There was nobody else for her to call. There was nowhere else for her to go. It wasn't because this was the best option. It was because it was the only option. And we need to give our community members more options, not just the Crest program. We need the multicultural center. We need the youth center. And we need a whole entire department for diversity, equity, inclusion, because that is a large, heavy, and weighted task. And there are so many different departments in this town that need to be evaluated under an anti-racist lens that one person themselves cannot do that. That is a very large task. And, and I, I was disappointed. This is an action plan that we've been asking for for a few weeks from the town manager. We have asked him to come up with a detailed action plan. And to me, this is not detailed. This doesn't state anything. Doesn't, this doesn't state how the budget is going to increase year by year in order to fill, fulfill these things. This doesn't, it, it's just a very loose plan to me. And so I'm very concerned about the implementation of our recommendations moving forward, especially if our group is not continued to be involved in the process. Um, I don't know if Paul wants to respond or why don't we hear from Deborah first and then I'm gonna ask Paul to see if he has any uh, comments to make. Um, I mean, again, you know, I, I keep on hearing like we need to, to, to shut down this meeting and everything. And, and you all have had so many meetings that you go on and on and on. This is a critical, important meeting. I don't want to hear again that we need to shut down this meeting. I have two kids that, I, that, that need me, but I'm here. Why? Because they understand that I'm trying to safeguard their life. I'm trying to safeguard that they don't get harmed. You think I want to be here at 907 talking to you all? No, I don't. But I'm here because I think it's critically important. And so you all should also feel that it's critically important. We're talking about a whole segment of, of the population of Amherst. And, and that's why I think you, you all are not getting that we keep on having to say the same things over and over again, because it seems like you all are not getting it. You keep on bringing up the things over and over again. It, it, it's just alarming to me. It's really alarming that this is what we're, we're having to do to bring up these issues. You know, uh, one of the one of the uh, residents said that you know we're at a cusp. You all have to take bold moves. You need to you know take the steps that's needed. Be brave. <laughs> Things when you charged us, you wanted us to create something different. If not, then you should have told us to create the same thing. No, it's different. I know it's scary. I know difference means scary, right? That's why BIPOC people always get it because we're different. But we need to be, you know, we need to be brave. We need to take bold steps. And it can't just be, right? That resolution, the beautiful resolution you all, you all created. That's talk. What we're doing, what, we're, what we recommend in terms of all our recommendations, that's doing the walk. Right? Can't be just talking. Can't be just writing a beautiful resolution with a whole bunch of words. It has to be about putting them into fruition. I understand it's scary, but we have to be able to do it. And now in terms of my three quick points, because I, I do have three quick points to make, right? And this is to Paul Bachelman. So Paul, when Brianna asked you about uh, cahoots, why aren't, aren't you... Uh, using cahoots as one of the places to, to to look at, and then you said it's because they have a con they they use contracts and when you use an employee, I get it, but that's a narrow segment. Cahoots has been in place for over thirty years. They've done a lot of good things, but they've also made a lot of mistakes. So they'd be willing to tell us the mistakes they made so that we don't make those mistakes, right? So you can't just just because they're a contractor model and we're an employee model now cahoots is out the window. No. 
you still have to go and consult with them because it's important because they've been doing this thing for 30 years and, and, and with a lot of success. One of the, one of the um, you know, markers that they threw out there is that last year with 24,000 calls, they only had to call uh, the police in for 150 of those calls. Because obviously they're huge, right? It, it's, it's Eugene and Springfield. They're huge. There's a lot of people in, in, their, in their cities. I get that. But out of 24,000 calls the last year, they only had to call in the police for 150. Let me let that sink in. So yes, consult with cahoots. <laughs> I think it would be a good idea. Don't just throw them out just because they use a, it's a contract tomorrow. I'm like, I, I just don't get it. And then, um, and then the CSWG, I said it when I, when I said it in the beginning, and, and Paul, you're being very kind of like general, not trying to really focus in. CSWG has to be part of putting these recommendations in place. They cannot expire on, on September 1st. CSWG has nothing to do with the oversight board. The oversight board, the resident oversight board is totally different, has a whole different set of parameters. So for you to say that, well, you're not sure because you know maybe the CSWG and the oversight board is gonna be the same. No, oversight board is gonna be over, overseeing and monitoring the police department, Amherst Police Department and Crest, right? We are going to be monitoring the recommendation, making sure the recommendations are put in place. However long that takes, we have to be involved at every step of the way, period. So, I mean, I hope I'm making myself clear because I've said it before, but then you answer some questions again, very, you know, uh, general and not really committing to anything. And then lastly, I didn't hear from my question, uh, you know, to you, Paul, about the fact that once press is fully, and it has to be because, right, if we're not, if we don't put a, put it fully in place, what it's going to do is it's going to fail, right? So hopefully, once it's put fu fully in place and it's successful, that means there's going to be less police. So if there's going to be less police, that funding is going to go to press. Correct? I want a response. I didn't hear that response. What is the response? I stopped there. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I don't know, Paul. Not sure. He, he's looking frozen on my screen, so I'm not sure. I. Okay. Am I being heard? Okay. No, uh, so I, I think it looks like Andy may be frozen. Um, so on the CAHOOTS model, I'm happy to look at the CAHOOTS. It, it is the gold, it's the standard that everyone looks at as the longest tenure. I wasn't dismissing it. I was just saying, uh, you know, the LEAP uh, consulting group, they, they consult, it's a, it, LEAP is not a program. It's a group that advises folks on programs because HOOTS is an actual program as in Albuquerque, Olympia, you know, all the different places. So I think we would want to look at all the programs. CAHOOTS is obviously has a ton of experience and we'd want to learn from that. The, the reason it is a different model than what the working group has recommended, uh, but there are other things and it's a, co so, so it's a, so it's, it's a, um, but it's something to learn from for sure. Um, the, um, you know, I, I think there, the, the, the mission of the concern, uh, uh, community safety working group was to provide, provide advice to the town manager. That's what the mission was. The, that mission ha will be completed when you're, you deliver the part B recommendations to the town manager. Then it becomes the town manager's responsibility to provide a budget to the town, to the town council. And it's only, it's, and so, and I've done that. So now the ball is in the town council's court to decide if they're going to approve that budget or not. Um, your charge for the working group goes till September 1st. And, you know, the intent, the reason I put September 1st in your charge was that knowing that your final report was due on June 30th, that you would be, need some time if there was reaction, if the council wanted to meet with you during the summer, if there were th things that needed to be cleaned up. It was never the intention for the working group to be a continuing body. And that's not my intention. There may be a body that needs to be continued, and that's why I want to talk about the reparations group. 
but the continuing body is not going is not set up to be the com community safety working group if you look at the charge it is a time limited charge it was set up purposely that way and i think we well i'm not sure if we talked about that or not at the beginning but um we the commitment when we asked people to participate was that it was to september 1st and that's what was written into the charge so and um and if, if and putting Crest in place fully in place, um, you know, I, I hear that and I, I understand that concern that unless it's up and running full fledged, it's really hard to judge whether it's successful or not. And I think that that comes into play with whether the phone number is actually being utilized or not, if there's a separate phone number, for instance. And it, it comes into play if, um, you know, you know if, if it's only, you know, it's, if it's not open all the time, people can't trust that they can call it when they're, they're not sure. And that, that creates some uncertainty. And, but I, I really believe that we need to start with a smaller program, even though it's not up and running to ultimately get there. I really truly believe that an, an alternative responder program, especially in this community is well needed and needs to be put into place. And I think, it, uh, I don't think any programs that have been, that have any of these community responder programs that have started have ever been terminated they've all proven their worth pretty quickly. So I think that this will be the case in our community too, because our community is really ripe for this kind of um, program. And I think, um, what is the impact on the police department was one of the things is, and I think, you know, it, we, we wanna model that too. We wanna look at what the, one of my present things was to say, what is the appropriate level for police department? What is the appropriate level for, for the CREST program? And we need to be looking at that objectively and with statistics. Um, so that we're building the right community safety model for the community of Amherst. Thank you, Paul. So maybe this is a good, uh, a good segue for me to say what I was going to say about the process and then I'll recognize a few more members of the uh, working group uh, before drawing it to the close. Uh, the finance committee is required by the charter to make a recommendation on the budget to the council. Ultimately, it is a council decision as to um, how to respond, but the council is limited by what the charter provides as the council's capacity within the budget. And this was not created by our charter commission just for Amherst, but is actually a part of state statute that applies all cities across the Commonwealth. And that is that the council can approve a budget, can um, reduce a funding line, can eliminate a funding line, but cannot add to a funding line. And that's what the charter says and that's what state law says. So when the council ultimately has to act before June 30th, it is within those limitations that it has to act. And I know that that's not a, uh, something that makes um, many of us always happy, but it is what the law is. And uh, that's kind of where we're at. But I do at least wanna uh, get back to the co-chairs of the group and then other members of the group. So uh, Brianna, do you wanna lead off or? Sure. So my comment was just, I recognize that our charge was to put together these um, reports, but I also want to remind you that part of our charge was engaging the communities most impacted by policing. And we have engaged them through hours of forums, surveys, and the consultants work. And those stories are horrifying, and I would never want somebody to relive them. So I think Paul, just on you sitting in on those meetings and hearing those lived experiences, you would want to keep us together to make sure that our recommendations are seen all the way out because there's a clear lack of mistrust between BIPOC community members and the town government. So I think it's critical that the CSWG stays together. And I also just want to emphasize that this conversation could have been a lot shorter if we were welcomed in the beginning of the conversation as planned. This 
whole the whole finance committee meeting was supposed to be catered toward the community safety working group we attended the community um the community safety finance committee in the audience and we listened to the um the chief talk the apd chief talk we listened to fireman nelson talk but now it's our turn to present and we're in the audience hearing others talk about something that we've spent months researching and months getting feedback from the community to inform our work so that's why this meeting is dragging out because you left us in the audience in the beginning and we are now evaluating the powerpoint that was said we're trying to answer questions that others have that were answered incorrectly and we're trying to provide clarity and also speak to the amount of um people that joined us during public comment and said what's what we have now in amherst is not working it is not working thanks Brian. um and uh sticking with the uh, two countries for solution did you have anything else um, yes, thank you. So Brianna stated uh, very well what I was going to say for the most part, but I just wanted to um, clarify that our charge was actually very specifically to make recommendations to alternative safety de to alternative safety services, things that are being done by the police right now that can be outsourced to other agencies to other departments. That was specifically our charge was to make the re those recommendations. And so you have them. And one of the recommendations that we made was to continue the CSWG. And so although I hear that you say that it was intentional that our group was ending, um, it is also intentional that we're requesting for it to not end. And so I think that you have the power to amend that decision um, at this time, because that is one of our recommendations. Um, I also, and, and I also am just curious as to what the intention was, like why was it intentional that we're ending? Um, I, I don't really understand that intention. And then I also heard the town manager state that he believes that a pilot is what we need. And I'm also very confused about that because once again, we have done the research and so we are the experts on this. And we have stated very clearly that we do not believe that a pilot is going to be successful and we do not believe that it's going to work. And so, so I just don't understand what research that belief is based out based off of, or, or where you come up with those findings. And and I'm I'm just really frustrated right now, and I apologize that I'm trying to to sort through this because we've been told a lot of misleading information. And and once again, I thought this meeting was entirely for us. We actually took a a doodle poll on to which day this meeting should be on that was best for all of the community safety working group members. We were instructed not to go to the first um, portion of the budget hearing with the finance committee because we were going to be given a meeting specifically for us. We are being silenced, we are be being limited and our voices are being reduced. And it's it's very difficult. Like I, I also agree with Deborah, I don't, I don't wanna be on this meeting so late but I've had questions and things I wanted to say the entire first portion of the meeting and I actually had my hand raised in the audience the entire time and didn't get any recognition at all. Um, and so I, I don't know where we go with this, but I think that I think that Mr. Balkman also needs to do better. And, and, and I, we've been being thrown around like the town council told us we're making our case to the town manager when we asked them. The town manager told us we're making our case to the town council. And so who, who's making the decisions here? And, and why aren't we all working together to figure out together how we can make this work since we all seem to agree that this is urgent and important, right? So why can't we work together? Why aren't you guys telling us what it is that you need from us so that we can make this happen? I'm just not understanding. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe I'll not respond immediately, but reserve comment, reserve response for a uh, couple of minutes so I can call in a couple other members of the working group. Uh, Pat? So I want to comment on the process tonight. You invited to come present our budget, that this was supposed to be a budget hearing. Our co-chairs presented and you never, and I'm addressing to you, Andy, you never asked anyone, um, the, school, uh, the uh, finance committee members or the school committee members, and council members to ask us questions with the budget. 
on Monday when we, pre when we presented, there were some questions that were supposed to be asked tonight and none of them were asked. I have children who studied finance, two of them. I have a kid that studied economics. I have a child that studied accountant. Two of my kids work at Wall Street. We have a finance director in this town that is advising how to uh, budget for CREST program. You all are very intelligent people and you want to you know, take what they recommended with the so-called management team. How on earth is four responders going to work it's been set up for failure. If any of my kids perform like this, they will lose their job. If any BIPOC professional present this type of budget for a program that is clearly going to fail, they will lose, your, they will lose their job. But the finance director is a white man. His job is protected. In fact, what happens in this town is that we, um, well, what happens in this town is that some of the people who perform very poorly get rewarded. The same person that performed in the school system for special education funding that was going into the special education attorneys and it was being presented at school committees as if all the money was going to the students with special needs when it wasn't. History is repeating itself. The person was being promoted. How much has he made in this town? Millions from taxpayers' money. And then we're here begging nickel and diamond to provide services for BIPOC people. We all pay taxes in this town. We are part of this town. We should have the same right that you all enjoy. More than $100,000 is devoted to golf course for white people. We have $100,000 set aside for uh, capital projects, temporary $100,000 and none of you and I'm trying to like control my emotion. None of you can bring that up. What I'm hearing is we want economic uh, development director. We want this because you always, you guys always get what you want. You guys wasted my time for months and to come to tonight and not even ask question. I have developed that budget. In my line of work, I have developed programs. I may have accent. I may not be as articulate as you guys are, but do not presume people the way you see them. Get to know them. This is not hard. We can get this off ground. There is money to get this done. Stop canceling BIPOC people. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. You guys should be very lucky, okay, that some of us are risking everything to speak truth to power. I have to negotiate every single day before I leave my house because everywhere I go is white spaces. The only place that is not white space is my place of business in Hadley. It's a, it's a refuge for me and my home. My, my place of business is very inclusive. Anybody can ask my, my 20 staff that I, I employ. You guys help drive, drive, drive me away in Ames. I used to run a business in Ames. It is not a welcoming community. I raised that awareness about what was happening in special education. I raised awareness about racism in 
um, business community. Okay, we should we should be better than this. To have a white woman, and I'm not attacking Mary Beth. She's a white social worker. She has experience in mental health, but she does not have. She does not live our experience. The management team should have done better, reach out to other BIPOC social workers, BIPOC psychologists, BIPOC people who have worked in the field to help you guys include CSWG uh, folks to come up with proposal. And you guys are accepting something that is down to fail. And our finance director is making a lot of money and this is what we get, mediocre service for BIPOC community. I have a lot to say. And please do not rush us tonight to end this meeting. I don't care if it's the midnight. We don't get to have this platform. Please treat us with respect. I have more to say, but I will yield. Do not shut down this meeting until BIPOC people, CSW says we're ready to, to leave. We have to speak our mind tonight because we won't have that opportunity again enough is enough please Ross. andy i want to address this comment to you and to the finance committee first i'm well aware that there is a law that says that the town council cannot increase any line item in the town manager's budget but the law also provides for you to request a new a revised proposal from the town manager. So do not hide behind some law that you can't do anything here. I'm asking that the finance committee request that the town council ask the town manager for a revised proposal with fuller funding for the CREST program. Uh, and if the town manager is not willing to do that, it's there is a mechanism whereby the town council can uh, actually make a change. And there's probably another method by which you can make this happen. So don't hide behind the law. You can make this happen. Thank you. Okay. Uh, then I'm going to, uh, because I think that we've heard from, well, I don't know, Ms. Bowman. Tashini. Hi. Um, so, to bounce off of what uh, Mr. Vernon Jones said, not only um, can the town council make a recommendation, but from what I understand, town council has the ability to um, not approve portions of those particular monies that are going to certain places. So, you guys absolutely have the ability to make change. It's all about whether or not you want to. Um, I just, I, you know, and that's, and that's the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing I wanted to say is that, um, if you've seen me on any of these meetings, um, with the CSWG, I usually don't last this long. I don't last this long because I literally have a house full of children right now that it is now 9, 9.20, uh, 32. They have yet to sit down for dinner. I've been trying to make dinner in between. Like every time I shut off the camera, I've been trying to make dinner in between. I'm here because this is important. This is important. And I personally am tired of not holding my white counterparts, um, not holding them accountable for their lack of motivation, for their lack of support. Um, and I wanna say something <clears throat> about that. Because there is one particular white person that I have um, 
thrown out props to whatever, given support to, told that, to, spoken about over and over again. And that is Mr. Vernon Jones. And I consider Mr. Vernon Jones a co-conspirator to the BIPOC community. I consider him a co-conspirator because he puts his effort, his time, his energy into making, making things different, to holding his own community accountable. If you don't know the work that he's tried to do over and been doing over the years, like, I don't know if he remembers this, but he and I had a conversation right when he decided he was leaving being principal over at Fort River School. And I was real mad. I was big mad. I was like, where are you going? <laughs> and he said, I need to work with other white people about issues regarding racism. And you know, we need to like look at this and hold ourselves accountable for this, what we're doing you know, as far as like how we're, we're interacting, how we're treating the BIPOC community. But, and I was like, at first I was like, eh. because the first thing that came to my mind is a situation where it's like, oh, you're going to suck in a bunch of, you know, people of color to come in and help you feel better about, you know, not being racist. And he was like, no, 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 no. We're, I want to work with other white people and holding other white people accountable for their movement through this world and so on and so forth. And I was like, oh, okay. So when, when I was, had the honor to have him be part of this community of the CSWG, I was like, what? Okay, I can't wait to hear the words that are coming out of his mouth. And let me tell you, he has yet to disappoint. He has been on point. He has been about it. He has been, he has not backed off at one little piece, he was like, he is holding his community accountable. And you know what? If you need, as white people in this community, as white people are part of the town, uh, about uh, part of town council and, you know, the finance committee and any other committee of, on town, you guys need to have a conversation with Mr. Vernon Jones, because I'm telling you right now, he will give you a whole new perspective. There are very few people that are white that I call co-conspirator. He is one of them because he is looking at it critically. He is looking at himself critically. He is doing the work day to day. That's what it takes to be, to be a person who is actively trying to be non-racist, not be part of the systemic racism. They work day to day. Every day they're working with themselves, trying to be critical of how they move through the world. How are they interacting with people of color? Are they interacting with people of color? Because that's a question that I have for me. How often do you interact with people of color? How often are you actually in their communities working with them, but not working with them as like, I'm going to teach you something. Working with them like, I'm going to sit back and listen. I will never forget the one thing that my ex-husband was told when he walks into a room, you need to sit down and be quiet when you're in a room of people of color. You need to see and hear and feel what is going on. You walking into a room as a white person, when there is a group of people of color, if there's even one people, person of color, you need to take a moment and listen. And that is what I have found, that this whole community it's, has failed. You guys don't want to listen. You don't, you guys don't want to hear because as soon as you're uncomfortable, you want to fight us. You want to make us feel bad about what we're fighting for. We're fighting for a space to be human, to be, to feel normal, to feel like when you walk into places like, um, Hastings, when you walk into places, businesses like 30 Boltwood, when you walk into these places and you don't look around and be like, everybody's looking at me. They're wondering why I'm here. Like literally that is what people of color feel walking into some of these businesses. Everybody turned and looked at me when I walked into the door. Even the family center, which is supposed to be a space for people of color. I mean, not for people of color, for people, like people in the community, a free space for people in the community to let their kids play together, so on and so forth. You know what? 
I stopped going there. I stopped going there with my last child. The reason why I stopped going there because for a couple of reasons. One, they moved it way out of like a space that was that was accessible. They moved it from the center of town to North Amherst. No longer necessarily, you know, you know, a place where people could just go to. You know, like there's all these little changes that you don't think are big deals, but they're they're constant microaggressions. That's what those are those are those are those microaggressions. Whenever we're questioned about a feeling that we have when it comes to, you know, I'm saying this and I'm saying how this is making me feel, and you're questioning me because you're like, well, why would you feel that way? Or I think you're misinterpreting how you know how this happened. You're questioning me. You're making me second guess myself. You're telling me that my feelings aren't valid. Every single time you do something like that, and those are, those things build up. They build up to the point where it's like then you we're yelling at you. We're yelling at you and we're telling you that like, you know, why? Why? Like and 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 I and I just want you to understand that. Like and I hope you do understand that. But I'm gonna stop speaking. I actually am gonna remove myself from the meeting because I really do have to feed my family and make sure my family is eating. So um, I thank you guys all for hearing me out tonight. Um, and I hope that you really start stepping up to the plate and really doing some honest, actual work to make a difference in this community. Because I've been here 30 years and you know, it would be nice to actually see and be part of some of this change. So thank you very much. And um, I, you know, I appreciate you letting me talk. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm gonna conclude just by saying one thing and that is that um, I'm very um, sorry if um, the choices made about process were not the correct choices, but they were made in good faith. And um, what we tried to do was to start with, by letting the first presentation, having the first presentation from the working group at our council meeting, and then um, asking for uh, the town manager to make a responding uh, a response to it, and uh, hear council questions, and then come back so that the last first word and the last word would be from the working group. And, uh, you know, if that was a bad choice, uh, you know, I'll take responsibility, but it wasn't the idea of start giving the first and last piece to the working group and having the other piece in the middle was certainly made by all of us and uh, at least in what we thought was um, a reasonable approach. Um, but given the time now, um, I do want to draw it to a close and uh, just see if uh, uh, so. I'm the only ones I'm going to recognize at this point, so I can draw it to a close, is um, one of the co chairs of the working group. If there's any concluding comments that you want to make, then I'd like to see if we can adjourn all groups. So, Brianna or Alicia? Last. Yes, thank you. So I'm um, Brianna's going to make our final closing comment, but I just wanted to state also that this is just this is a, uh, a very good example of the way that intention versus impact works and even further emphasizes the importance of our recommendations. The intention around the spaces that created in this town, and I apologize, but they do not matter. What matters is the real impact that they have. And so I really urge you to keep that in mind when you're moving forward, that your intentions do not matter. What matters is the real impact that they have on the community. And the community has spoken many times to let you know what the impact is. And now it is your responsibility to act, not to make excuses and not to continue to push us off and say at another time, because there is no better time this is overdue. And so now is the best time. 
And so I urge you all to keep those things in mind moving forward. And I wanted to end with that comment, but I, it's just really bothering me also that I wanted to bring up that, that at the beginning of this meeting, if the intention was just to give the, the town manager his time to the slideshow, then the APD and the fire chief did not need to be brought in because they were not even presenting. So for their presence to be there and not ours is a very highly problematic and is a demonstration of right, white supremacy. If there was going to be anybody else on the screen that was not presenting, it should have been our group. Thank you. Thank you. Brianna, uh, anything else or before we adjourn, get all the groups to adjourn? Yeah, Andy, I think just going forward when the community safety working groups recommendations are spoken about, it would be helpful for members or people from leadership to be in the room um, just to emphasize Alicia's point. And I also just want to emphasize that integrity is when your intentions and actions meet each other consistently. So if your intention is to create a more equitable town, then it's the time to act. So thank you. Um, do you want to adjourn first or would you rather have me uh, have Lynn adjourn the uh, council first? Whatever works better for you. Why don't you go ahead and adjourn and then I'll ask Linda to adjourn the council and I'll adjourn the finance committee. Is Dashina's hand still up? I'm sorry, I'm put it down. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay, um, I want to I want to motion to, to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you for having us. And hopefully in the future, we can be present at all conversations in regards to our recommendations. Lynn, you want to adjourn the council? Yes, uh, there, the town council meeting on um, May 27th is adjourned. Thank you. And the finance committee is adjourned. Thank you and good night all. Thank you everyone.